right. We should be we should be live. Welcome to our five o'clock technical Thursday. I almost said Friday, Nihad. Well, almost, almost said Friday. Friday. And we got Nihad El Sharif with us. Thank you, Nihad, for joining us. We're talking groundfall protection of equipment. Are you ready, Nihad? I'm ready. Thanks for the invite, Tom. It was a pleasure to join you. We can do it in person like we used to, so at least we can do it virtually. Yeah. You know, um, I tell you what, though, I think that uh, this whole uh, doing virtual, this whole virtual thing is not, uh, I mean, I, I know COVID is a bad thing, but um, it's really uh, getting us connected with a lot more people. than We would have never have seen Felix Sandoval or Gustavo Chavez uh, at, at any of the IEEE meetings that we go to, so... I totally agree. I mean, there's, you know, the uh, uh, online connection is great and, of course, has a much further reach than uh, in person. But I still miss the in person meetings, you know. Not to say that we give up this after COVID. We should continue doing this. I mean, you should continue doing this when you can. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, all right. Well, today's topic is around groundfall protection of equipment, principles, and applications. And, uh, Nihad, uh, I really appreciate you, you know, wanting to help out with this. And most of the slides that we're going to see today, pretty much, I mean, there's, there's a lot of this is, is your work. So I really appreciate you, um, stepping up to the plate and helping out. And, and because I know that when was the last one you and I did? It was in Reno in March. I know it feels like forever, but it was the last trip. Well, no, but when was the last live session that we did? The live session was, I want to say in June, the G, uh, the uh, Shock Week, remember? That was Shock Week. That was GFCIs. That's what I, I remember that now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, by the way, I haven't got my Shock Mug yet. <laughs> oh, you know what? You're right. Um, I I thought those things shipped. So, in fact, I just told Bobby Joe, I'm going to ship those out this week. I'm like, oh, my gosh. that's was, That was like, uh, that was a heck of a while ago. But It's okay. I'm looking. But it was, you're uh, going to look for it because a... neither did... Um, Neither did uh, uh, Mathur Abbasi. He didn't get one then. There was, I think I gave five mugs out. So I got all five of them in my garage. I'm, I've got to ship them out. So sorry about that. Yeah, I think my, I think you probably gave more than five because I remember my serial, my serial number was five. I was going for the number one. I know. Mug, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I think Mathur, Mathur got it. So Mathur's Mathur. getting number one. Absolutely. Yeah, I got the number one. It wasn't me. Absolutely. So let's, since, since there's probably more, there's probably people who are going to be watching this video that don't know who you are. Why don't you give your, just give us a background on uh, who is Nihad Al Sharif? Uh, sure. So first of all, thanks. Thanks everyone for spending your uh, evening with us. Uh, Tom and I uh, greatly appreciate it. I've been a big fan of all Tom's videos. So it's kind of more of a, an audience. And this time I get to be uh, participating, which is always great. Uh, my name is Nihad El Sharif. Uh, I'm an electric engineer, professional electric engineer. I have a master's in protection uh, of power systems and an MBA, master's of business administration. Uh, I'm a senior member of IEEE, and uh, I've been, I guess, involved in the industry for uh, maybe ten years or so. Uh, being involved with different uh, different aspects of the industry, and like I'm just showing on the screen here some codes and standards I've been involved with. Uh, it's, I mean, I just want to make sure that, you know, I guess what I'm going to be sharing today is my personal opinion. It's just not going to be representative or reflect, reflecting of any of the uh, code making panels or standards that I sit on. Uh, one thing I would share since we're talking, like I'm showing panel two and Tom and I are sitting on panel two. Uh, currently, there was some change. I'm representing actually on code making panel two for the NEC. And because of some change of representation, there's going to be, uh, I'm not technically a member anymore but uh, hopefully the next in first week of december there will be another meeting coming up for the nfpa uh, standard council and hopefully we get our membership back so just in case if you go on the nfpa website my name is not on the committee because we were all i triple a presentation was removed back in uh, i believe september 1st it was but hopefully we're all going to be added back to the committees on uh, on the uh uh first week of December to start the uh, first draft meeting in uh, December, hopefully. Uh, I, I'm based out of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. You probably don't know where Saskatoon is. You can look it up. Uh, uh, if Larry Air is online, he would know that Saskatoon, he always calls me Saskatoon. I don't know if Larry's on, but like, it's always fun. Uh, 
I was born in Cairo, Egypt, because I had the questions, a couple questions before, I guess, my last presentation with Tom on Shock Week, like where I'm from, not from India, not that I have anything against India, but I was just born in Cairo, Egypt. I've been living, in, I'm Canadian now, I've been living here for almost 15 years. Uh, I'm kind of also honored to be on the, uh, uh, serve on the uh, board, uh, on IEEE Industry Application Society Board of Directors. And uh, for two years now, I've been on as a member at large. And recently, Tom, you don't even, you don't know this because two weeks, two months ago, I believe, I was uh, nominated and appointed for uh, IEEE Canada board. So I'll be the industry, uh, uh, industry chair, industry relation chair, industry, industry relation chair. Uh, my appointment starts in January of next year, so I haven't done anything. Congratulations. Oh, thanks, Tom. And I reach out to industry and Eton is on my list. So I'm going to be hit you up on the industry relationship. We need to do more for the industry and for, for everyone. This is IEEE Canada, but you guys have nothing against Canada, right? No, absolutely not. Oh, we got we got a lot of a lot of people up in Canada on the team. I know. I know. It's just like the border is just a border. Most of my friends are from the U.S. and industry-wise. But yeah, yeah, I guess this is kind of me in a nutshell. Excellent, excellent. Well, welcome, and uh, you're, you're you're as active as I am. I know I see you all over the place. Uh, I'm on panel two and panel ten, and to that, like Nihat says, we uh, what we what we talk about is our own opinions. It's it's you know, it's not set in stone, and anything that we say, it's not the opinions of NFPA or anybody else. So, so and congratulations, we got a congratulations uh, coming online. I don't know what the heck. It looks. I don't know what that symbol is. Uh, I guess that might be. Um, maybe you have a special person watching, Nihad. Oh, no. This is uh, congratulations. I, I'm not sure. This is uh, not Chinese. It's not Arabic. Oh, I guess okay. You're to my mom, right? Because so my mom. Okay, here's the thing. As Tom and I were talking about this offline. My mom is lives in Cairo still, and it's midnight, and she knows I'm doing this with Tom, and she said she's going to call in. Hi, Her mom. English is. Yeah. Hi, mom. If she's watching, her English is. I mean, she can probably get by, but I don't. She'll be bored. I, I don't think she'll be there for the whole thing. And plus, like, like she won't be understanding everything. But Tom and I are saying hi. Excellent. Midnight, Excellent. midnight in Egypt now. If you're wondering. So. Midnight in Egypt. All right. So Nihad, uh, the airbag analogy. You want to enlighten us a little bit? Sure. So you know, I when Tom and I were talking about this, and this is kind of something I. You know, I like to use analogies a lot. And uh, the one thing with the image there is, you know, airbag. And, uh, you know, all of us know airbags. I hope you never get to experience an airbag because, you know, it doesn't kick in unless there is an, an accident. Uh, so something is wrong. But otherwise, it just sits there. It's more like, a, you know, like a, your last line of defense, like a guarding angel hiding there. You don't even know that it's there unless some until something bad happens, right? So... Uh, my analogy is the uh, you know uh, think about it what what's the most important thing for an airbag system it must be reliable right it must operate when it's supposed to and it shouldn't operate when it when it's not supposed to right like you just uh, it's so inconvenient to have an airbag you know like uh, there's activating when there's no accident so just like sitting in your car or driving and then the airbag activates it's pretty yep. cumbersome and it's just a hassle right so Back to what Tom was saying, the analogy, uh, the way I think of protection in general, like protective sy protection systems in general, not just ground fault protection, which is the topic of this uh, of our presentation, the protection systems are more or less the uh, airbag of a power system. So you have your power system, like your vehicle, and then you have an airbag, which is your protection system that is waiting there, more like vigilant, waiting for something bad to happen or something goes wrong, and then it will just kicks in and saves the day kind of thing. So... Uh, if we continue with this analogy, the one thing that is different between, like, well, of course, and protection system and power system, that it must be reliable as well. So, you know, the, like, you know, we'll talk about nuisance stripping. It's nuisance stripping is the opposite of reliability. It must be reliable. A ground fault or a protection system in general operates when it's supposed to operate and restrain or cease from operation when it, you know, when it's not supposed to. The one thing that is the main difference, in my opinion, is. An airbag system is designed, built, installed by one entity, the manufacturer of a vehicle. That they just the engineers there look after the whole system, right, from A to Z kind of thing. But in power systems, it's not the same case. Uh, you have uh, the owner of a power system could be 
maybe utility or like an industrial entity, it's very different than the designer, the manufacturer of a protective system. And then most cases, there'll be a third party involved in installation and uh, commissioning. So it'll be like another entity that it looks after the commissioning, testing, and all those kind of things. Right. So as engineers or electrical professionals, it's very important for us to understand, you know, all the details. Like Tom and I were discussing things like, you know, the uh, the the theory of operation, how your relay operates, whatever the kind of relay is. Like in this case, we're talking about ground fault relays, but in general, you need to understand how the relay works, like the theory of operation, uh, how to test it. Uh, codes and standards required, like what's, you know, the HD, what, what the HD, uh, HD is the uh, authority having jurisdiction, what, what they require for you to do, uh, testing, commissioning, um, all those kind of things. And very important, of course, to test, because like I said, the airbag protection system, they're sitting there. They're unlike, let's say, a rotating machine. It's moving. When it's not moving, you know, there's a problem, right? With protection systems, it's not supposed to do anything until there's a problem. Right. So what? if your system fails and then it doesn't kick in when you need it so it's very important to understand how to maintain it testing and all those kind of things so this was kind of my, my airbag analogy that i kind of thought maybe to start this presentation with yep and there's a lot of parts like you have on this yep. screen here there's there could be you know in some cases uh a a, a miniature molded case circuit breaker like one you would have in the house everything is combined like a, like a GFCI circuit breaker or a GFCI receptacle or or a circuit breaker miniature that has GFPE ground fault protection of equipment. That's all self-contained. But the, when you get closer to the service entrance equipment, your ground fault protection of equipment system is no longer a single device. You have sensors to your point. You have the relay itself. It will probably be shunt tripping a circuit breaker or an opening a switch. So. There are a lot of parts and pieces into your point you know reliability is is in is important on these because they are either life-saving or they're equipment saving uh you like you say you don't want them you don't want them opening for no reason uh, but you want them to respond when you need them to respond because they're there for a reason so yeah, absolutely so uh like tom said like i, I can maybe quickly go through the blocks. Again, this is uh, any protection system in general. I want to talk about ground fault, but like Tom said, the, the, the more you get medium voltage and utility kind of higher voltage systems, uh, everything becomes more modularized, not just have one one device, like a, the example that Tom used was the uh, miniature GFCI breaker that has everything. But in general, uh, even those miniature systems would have all those blocks, but they're all in one unit or in one enclosure. So mainly a sensor is it's like a transducer. Its uh, its job is to translate or change a physical signal mm -hmm. into some electrical output, proportional electrical output that is fed to a protective relay. So sensors could be a current transformer, which is the main sensor that we'll be using for this presentation. A potential transformer, a voltage transformer, uh, light sensors. If you're doing arc flat arc fault relays, could be a temperature sensor, a pressure sensor, whatever physical signal that you are using to make your decision. And then this sensor, like it's a transducer, it's a, it just translates this physical quantity and generates a proportional, uh, usually voltage signal, sometimes current signal that is uh, scaled and at a level that is appropriate to be fed to a protective relay. And yeah. then the protective relay is more or less the brain of this whole system. It just takes the signal coming from your sensor, processes the signal and decides if there's something wrong or not. If something, if there's no problem, then the system back to reliability doesn't do anything it's reliable it just stays quiet but if the protective relay decides that there's a problem it would have it must send a command a trip signal it comes from the brain to your muscle and the muscle in this case is your circuit breaker hmm. because the circuit breaker is the uh, the device or the, uh, the 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 mechanical device that would interrupt open the energize the circuit open the circuit to interrupt power and you know kind of mitigate the hazard, whatever the hazard is. So these top three blocks are the main blocks for any uh, protective uh, relaying system. Uh, the, the bottom two blocks are optional. I would say sometimes you find it, sometimes not. So for example, you could have batteries like a backup. So uh, some systems where they're critical, you would have a backup, a battery system that is that serves as a backup in case you lose your uh, your main power. So your system is up and running. And then communication channels 
not in every protection system, more like in the advanced ones, and they're mainly used for logging your fault data, like your uh, fault current value, waveforms whatsoever. And in some protective schemes, like the zone, uh, zone selective interlocking, and you know Tom did a great video on zone selective interlocking yeah, uh, weeks ago, and I watched it and enjoyed it. So if you haven't, please watch it. It's very, it was very informational. But the zone selective interlocking, you need to send a signal to inhibit or enable tripping of a remote device. And this is done through communication. Again, it's not uh, most of the protective systems that we're going to discuss today, they probably don't have communication channels. Doesn't nothing stops them from having communication channels, but you know, it's it's usually for specific systems that are more advanced. Yeah, and if you think about like uh, when you get into larger equipment, your medium voltage assemblies, your big 480 volt switch gear, you're going to see these batteries because the relays well, more than likely, they're, they don't run on 480 volts. They run on 120 volts, and or they'll run off of a DC ba of, of, uh, a battery supply that basically supplies power so that even when power goes out, that relay is still being, uh, the brain is still active, so to speak. Because in some cases, during a fault, you can have a lower voltage signal that you could lose power to that relay. You don't want that to happen, right? So you want to supply power to keep the brain alive so that during a fault condition, the device operates and functions correctly. Yeah, because you know, absolutely right, Tom. And we have a slide that's gonna be discussing this condition that you just mentioned when you lose the, the voltage drops, but it's absolutely correct because like I said, relays or protection in general is supposed to work when there's a problem. So the last thing that you want is something happens, like a fault or a problem, that would land your uh, protection system inoperable. Because this is the and this is the opposite of reliability, right? So we have to make sure that the system is going to work under all uh, abnormal conditions. I would say. Yeah, yeah. And this is an example of a a piece of switch gear where you have uh, you have uh, power circuit breakers. Uh, there's a meter back there. You'll see there's a relay way on the other end. Um, but you'll have equipment where ground fault protection of equipment may be in the circuit breaker. It may be in a relay. But that's just one example of uh, the complete assembly once it's all together. But then inside that assembly, you probably have, to your point, sensors, which is, uh, and one of those are current transformers. And, you know, I, Nayad, I never thought about what you said. Uh, you mentioned taking physical characteristics and translating them into something else. And if you think about a current transformer, it's taking that, that current, which is the going through the conductor, going through the, the donut, so to speak, what we call what I call the donut thing, right? And it's the magnetic fields that it is uh, picking up. So in a way that's a mechanical, but yet an electrical um, example of how that works and functions. I think in physics, what the term they use is transducer because it just it's a device yeah. that trans it's one physical quantity to another quantity, and in this case, it's current, usually high currents that is translated to a much lower level. You know that most of the current transformers are, let's say, five six hundred to five or one hundred one like whatever the maybe one hundred to five whatever the return ratio is. And in Europe, they use the one for the secondary, so it's six hundred to one. Like in North America, it's five. But the point is. Uh, you would try to scale your your signal in this case current to make sure that it's safely fed into your brain the the relay. Uh, one unique thing about current transformers, like Tom is showing the slide here that has different kinds of current transformers, and they have different applications. We'd be more focused on the Windows CT current transformer because it's the one that's most popular. But the one unique thing about current transformers, if you notice, it's a transformer, right? So a transformer we know from electrical circuit courses in the first year engineering or technology uh, technologist degrees that you must have a primary and a secondary for a, any transformer, right? The current transformers are unique because they don't have a primary. Their primary is the conductor. So in this case, in this window CT, like donut, like Thomas mentioned, that's called donut as well. There is an opening. And then the, this is the secondary that you're seeing here in the picture. The primary is the conductor that is fed through this donut or through this window. This is the uh, the primary of the current transformer. And through the magnetic effects, like Thomas was saying, uh, a voltage would be induced on the primary, on the secondary side, which is proportional to the current uh, going through the CT window, 
through the cables or the conductor that you're feeding through. And this current is fed, or this voltage signal is fed to your relay to make a decision whether there is an overcurrent condition or ground fault or all those kind of things. Okay, so I, you know, I almost forgot, and 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 I did forget earlier, and you reminded me, and I forgot. <laughs> Minty. Yeah. Now I remember. Yeah. Forgot. Yeah. I so, you, I I forgot. This is the item that we forgot about, Nihad. We have, uh, we did a question, we did a survey. Um, and so anybody out there watching this right now can go to open up another window, browser window, and uh, go to menti.com, M E N T I.com, and use the code that's shown over here 1758 30 and 0 and um, answer the questions that you see on that screen. So I'm just gonna do this real quick just to make sure. If I go to menti.com, so I'm gonna do this uh, for everybody right now. I go to menti.com and I am going to enter 1758, three zero and zero. And hit cement or submit submit i'm gonna cement it but uh you know click the heart or whatever and it'll let us know you see the little heart go and then what you'll do is you'll answer these questions uh ground fault protection is used for and uh what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at the answers and um and see how they go so okay muhammad uh the code is oh i'll put this in the the code is 17, 58, 30, and 0. It's a very short quiz, and it's anonymous, completely anonymous. We'll see uh, how many people online uh, right now. I'm not sure how many people we have watching, but uh, I'm going to close that to minimize my bandwidth. But we'll take a look at... Um, let's see. I can, I can hide results. I can close vote. I'm not going to close vote, 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 voting. I went from, I went, submit became cement. Voting became voting. Jeez, oh man. Yeah. And, I, and I thought I had an accent, Thomas. Okay, so I'm going to hide results. So uh, ground fault protection is used for equipment protection, personnel protection, both, and I'm not sure. Now, uh, you know, Neha, you made a few of these questions. I think I added one or two. That's real short. But I hear a lot of people throw this term around. They'll say, make sure you have ground fault protection. And when I look at these answers, I know I can probably put this answer into either equipment protection or personnel protection. Or I could probably say ground fault protection is for both. Because... I think ground fault protection is a very generic term. Did you do that on purpose? Well, I was thinking ground fault protection is like, I, mean, I guess the topic of what we're discussing, GFPE, right? So uh, it is generic. And I know it's a little bit confusing because if you think of it, GFCI are protecting people against ground fault as well. The only difference is, you know, the, 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 the protection level, the, the, the sensitivity, if you may, of, of GFCIs are much uh, higher than sensitivity of ground fault uh, relays or GFPEs. And the reason is we are, as humans, are more sensitive to current than your motor, your, your appliance. Appliances, they don't really care uh, about, they can tolerate more, more, more ground fault current for sure, but we can. Right. So the, I think the key behind this question is that ground fault protection of equipment is for equipment only. When you say ground fault circuit interrupters or ground fault protection for personnel, I think the code book, I'll grab the code book. The, the code book specifically calls out, like if I look at uh, 210.8, the title of 210.8 in the National Electrical Code says ground fault circuit interrupter protection for personnel. And in 555, when we, when we put the information in for marinas, 
we use the term in 555 dot 555 trying to find the there it is 555.35 says ground fault protection of equipment and ground fault circuit interrupter protection the moment you say ground fault circuit interrupter protection you know you're into personnel protection because of what the definition of that uh, and we're very clear on what we say, ground fault protection of equipment. But 555 used to say just ground fault protection like you had here. And it had both GFCI and GFPE requirements in it. But they wanted to be very specific in the titles because I think people get more confused when we just say ground. I've heard people say, go get me a GFI. Yeah. You know, and and I I know we all know what we mean, but... Terms, terminology, definitions, I think, are important. So, you know, I totally agree with you. The thing is, I, this is kind of, I guess, my terminology, and I, I, you're absolutely correct. We should be more careful because I've always considered ground fault protection is ground fault protection for equipment. Like, they're the same thing. But yeah. ground fault protection for personnel is GFCI. And I know people, some people use GFI, but it's GFCI. But yep. where my head was at when I when I was thinking of this question about this question was, uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about this, uh, spend too much time on this. We cover this in uh, during our shock week uh, GFCI presentation. But my point was, with some uh, ground fault protective relays or GFPE with the new technology, you can go down to levels that are you can detect five milliamps, for example, which is the uh, GFCI personal protection level. But yet it's still a ground fault protection. Because it's you know because of the standard that it needs and the way it's designed, although yep. you're detecting five milliamp, but it's not proper for ground fault protection because of reasons that Tom and I discussed in our other presentation. Like we just don't have time to go through it now, but just have to be very careful. Not because you have a, a, a relay that is listed to UL1053, which we're going to be discussing, that can detect five milliamperes. You say, oh, this is good for personal protection. It is not because of different reasons. Yep. Now this question here, this question here gets to the performance of a 1053 device because it's UL 1053 is the standard for ground fault protection of equipment and um, ground fault relaying. Uh, it's the so the the question basically is is a specific amount of current set for pickup current and a trip time of ground of a ground fault relay or a ground fault ground fault protection of equipment for. Um, um, for GFPE, like a little 30 milliamp miniature circuit breaker, we've got six saying true, one false, and two not sures. So this is an interesting one because there's only one person out there who got it right. Yeah, and it wasn't me because I didn't do this. <laughs> wasn't me either. So, you know, sorry to crash the party, but unfortunately this is not true. And we, Tom and I have a slide that we're going to be covering yep, this. we so do. Wait, wait for this, but just for now, this is false. This is not true. And this is one reason for, like one of the reasons that, you know, ground fault protection of equipment, GFPE, is not appropriate for personal protection. Yep. Because and, this time that we're discussing. In yep, and we'll, we have slides on that. So all eight people need to hang in there. Okay, you according to Tom, this one person uh, deserves a mug. Yeah, one person deserves a, a ground fault protection of equipment mug. According to the 2020 National Electrical Code, performance testing of ground fault protection systems is done using primary, secondary, both, and I am clueless is in there. Yeah, we'll be covering this as well, but those who said uh, both are not correct, unfortunately. Those who said secondary are not correct as well. The right answer is primary injection only. And you kind of notice it specifically calls out 2020 NEC for a reason yes. that, again, Tom and I were going to be dis discussing down the road that, that later, but yep. just like the very specific language, 2020. And I think we could have said 2017 as well. <laughs> Muhammad, <laughs> Muhammad says, I didn't know we were competing for mugs. <laughs> uh, well, too late, buddy. I'm sorry. Here's the thing. Even if I commit to giving you a mug, you probably won't get it till next year, right? <laughs> Six months. Uh, Tom, you just got your basement or your garage will get another a new mug. <laughs> I love it. Uh, how about this one? A 30 milliamp GFPE device 
will trip instantaneously for any ground fault current greater than 30 milliamps. I added this one. I know this is your question. Yep. And, and the right answer is false. And we're going to cover that when we get into the 1053 uh, parameters. The right answer to this, so four people are going to probably want a mug out of that one. But um, uh, yes, so that's uh, four people. So it is false. At 30 milliamps, the device isn't going to trip. And we're going to get into those thresholds when we start talking about the standard. All right, so that was the that was, and I didn't want to forget doing that. So now let's get back into our regularly scheduled program. All right, so this is an example of a switch, a fusible switch that has uh, what you what you see down here on the bottom is the um, uh, the zero sequence current transformer. So we we have these are your window CTs. Uh, we're basically using what we call that a zero sequence CT when it pulls in all. Uh, the the phase conductors and the neutral so um, all of those conductors pass through there and we call it zero sequence because of zero sequence you have positive negative and zero sequence if you know your symmetrical components your mr fortescue who invented the uh, the mathematical uh, process of using uh, symmetrical components which i could i'd love to do a program on that one for the engineers out there but we know that phase if you put all of those conductors a b and c in neutral or if you don't have a neutral, just A, B, and C, that zero sequence CT will put zero current out. The moment you have an imbalance, current going anywhere outside of the circuit, you'll see that imbalance come back in the zero sequence CT. So I just thought that was interesting to, to put that uh, up there. So let's talk about relay technologies. Really cool. Uh, Tom, uh, can you still hear me? My, yes. The screen kind of freeze. I, I don't know. There's something wrong. I mean, everything is freezing on my end. I can I see I you. I can still hear you. Everything is fine on, on our end. So what I'm showing right now is the relay technology screen, uh, starting with the 1900s when you had electromechanical relays. And yeah. it was in the 60s that we introduced the uh, electronics uh, so solid state uh, static relays. You know what? Now it's back. Sorry. Like for some reason, for the last couple, maybe a few seconds, the screen froze, so I couldn't see anything. Yep. We and then we got, got microprocessors entered in 1980s. So this is sort of going over a little bit of the histories. And one of the, 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 I mean, to put things into perspective, in 1958, uh, they unveiled the first integrated circuit, uh, which is the computer chip, right? And that was a guy by the name of Jack Kilby. And it wasn't until 64 that uh, Doug, Doug Engelbert uh, showed a prototype of the modern computer. So if you think about... Uh, GFPE entered the code 1971, and and if you think what was going on in the late 60s and in the 70s, we we didn't have a computer, uh, a desktop computer until the mid 70s. 69, uh, that's when the uh, uh, Unix operating system was created, and computers filled the size of rooms, right? Um, yeah. and, and then in right. 1970, Intel uh, introduced the first uh, dynamic. Uh, random access memory chip. So for all of those who out there who understand uh, digital electronics, you know, you had your, you have your RAM and your called DRAM. Uh, so that didn't come till the 1970s. So when you had, when you had from a, from a circuit breaker perspective and a fusible switch, we didn't have the electronics that we have today. And, and in 1971, ground fault protection of equipment uh, being in a relay that was mounted in the same equipment that was, you know, telling something to open was really state of the art. And that was like, that was just huge. The uh, putting that much computing power inside of a relay before that, to your point, it was all electromechanical. You had, you had, uh, um, uh, magnetic uh, and your discs that were turning and and whatnot. It was very mechanical devices. You know, even before microprocessors were invented, so there's I know it was it's not quite very popular, but there was like a short transition between electromechanical and microprocessor based relays. It was static or solid state relays, and these guys were, you know, like just electronics. They were using transistors, operation amplifiers, op amps, and uh, like logic, logic gates, uh, logic gates, and all those kind of things. So it started with some 
I guess, so those electronics, more like analog electronics. And then as the technology electronics develop, they start using digital electronics. So you got like flip flops and uh, yep. analog to digital converters and all those kind of advanced things, but it was still solid state. And they called it static because there was no moving parts. So you got rid of the, your disk and, and your uh, coil, which made the uh, life longevity, all, you know, uh, the uh, end of life for the relay, the longevity of the, the relay is longer because you don't have any moving parts and it's yeah. smaller because of this electronics, right? But then, of course, they got into, we got into microprocessor. And like Tom was saying, in the early days, we didn't have this amount, this uh, computational power to have multifunction relays. So you have like one chip, one processor that would just do one specific function. Today, you have a relay that can do like multiple functions, like multi-function relays, because now we have microcontrollers. We can you know, program and have more comp computational capabilities. So it was just like one relay at the time, sorry, one function at the time. So you need 10, maybe 20 different relays to protect your motor. But now you can have one smart intelligent unit. That I'm, I'm sure I've seen Eaton and all the other manufacturers manufacture mm -hmm. those uh, devices that would just do all the protection function that you will require for your motor or your generator or whatever the uh, what you're protecting is. So yeah. uh, you know this was kind of the microprocessor. But then we got into the 2000s, like I guess the new millennium, uh, millennial, uh, the millennium, uh, what they called IED intelligent electronic device, and those were even more powerful than microcontrollers. To the point that, you know, up until that point, there was always a difference or a delineation between protection and control. You have your protection system and control mm -hmm. system. But with IEDs now, you can have one, again, one device that can do both protection and control of your motor or your pump or whatever equipment that you want to control. So now I mean, everything is getting smaller and smaller. And I mean, it's open-ended, but I'm sure most of you, or if not all of you, uh, already heard of the IoT, Internet of Things, and you know this is kind of the next big jump, the next big uh, I guess revolution. We don't know how how it's going to be. Uh, re protection is going to shape under the uh, IoT uh, world yet, but I'm sure there's going to be an impact on on protection. So now you're going to have everything will be like connected to your uh, I don't know internet or app yeah. or some kind of IoT thing. Yeah, and this is. I don't know. This is a good example of showing you, like, your to your point that back in the '70s and and even in the '80s, you probably had uh, well, yeah, you, even in, in those early time frame, you had one relay did one function, and today, uh, this is just an example, like a, a, a you know, this is a catalog number EDR three thousand, but a th this specific relay does a phase instantaneous overcurrent, ground instantaneous overcurrent. That's your 50G, your 51G is your instantaneous ground fault protection. Um, your 50 and 51 R's, you have a, num a total of 11 different curves, uh, zone selective interlocking, and then current imbalance. And then depending upon the relays, you can get all of the different types of functions and features all in one uh, one in um, uh, type of device. And that is, uh, I think that's, a, that's an important part of this aspect to say, you know, there's a lot going on in one device, and 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 from your simplicity perspective, you know, we said that um, a lot of this equipment, depending upon the parts and pieces, the more complicated and mechanical it gets, uh, the reliability starts to become in question. The need for maintenance becomes uh, even more of a question, and then uh, you impact your reliability overall in the power system. Right. So. I guess this slide that you're showing, again, it's just like gonna we try to sum up the whole discussion. So you have a protective relay, your brain, the brain needs inputs to process information. So the inputs, like I said, Tom and I said, could be uh, voltage, current, pressure, temperature, the output basically of a sensor or a transducer that is fed into your relay. And then you can have a different set of inputs that are the setting that Thomas was talking about. You can have, you know, like you can set your time, trip time, or pickup value, let's say the, uh, Current pickup value voltage or the uh, light intensity. If you have a, a you know, like a uh, uh, an arc fault, arc flash relay that just is activated via light or temperature, degree, whatever, all those inputs that you need to set, it all goes into your brain on the relay, and then the relay process everything and then makes a decision. For the most part, the, the output signal goes to a breaker, the, you know, the muscle, like we said, to remove power or de-energize the circuit. But in some cases, this is not, you know, 
uh, valid all the time. In some cases, you only need maybe some alarm, some alarm system. So you need like a visual signal or maybe some uh, sound, make like a certain kind of uh, uh, an output to just tell you that there is a problem, but just keep power. This is very important for uh, critical systems. Like you don't want to interrupt power. It could be more hazardous if you interrupt yeah. power without you know notifying people. So sometimes your system, your protection system is just giving you an indication that there's a problem or it could be built for communication just like like we were just from use the uh, zone selective interlocking just kind of communicate with something else to do the job so so yep. can, that could, I guess the bottom line is protective relays now with the technology we have they have they can have different outputs that would serve different functions depending on the system design yeah what i like here is you have you have your your inputs, which are your, your like your current transformers. If you have your your PTs, your potential transformers and whatnot, uh, and you might have other relays and whatnot coming, uh, other uh, sensors like you say light and whatnot coming into a relay. Just in general, not necessarily just GFPE, but like you have an arc flash relays come into your relay. That's where the brain happens. It digests all of that information, and then it gives you visual outputs, gives you alarms. Uh, and any communications and, and all that good stuff. So let's talk about ground fault. Ground fault is any unintentional connection between an energized conductor and ground. So I think that's pretty simple. Is that That's right out of the uh, National Electrical Code, right? It's the, both the National Electrical Code and the Canadian Electrical Code. They pretty much have the same definition. Perfect. So uh, I love your toaster example. Um, <laughs> I know a toaster is not supposed to have a equipment grounding conductor, but let's say my toaster here has an EGC, the green conductor. Yep. And then you do what I do all the time when the bread gets stuck down in there, you just take a fork and then you shove it down in there and you try to get the bread out, which could cause a fault, right? Because you're not supposed to do that. And you could cause a, uh, an, a ground fault that goes to that case of the toaster. And then the current goes outside of the path. It does, you know, the normal flow of current should be over the the, the black conductor and back on the white conductor. And uh, any current that goes outside of that zone of protection is what is where you're either your GFCI or your ground fault protection of equipment. And the difference there is going to be the threshold of trips and the clearing time for for between those two. The GFCI is there to protect your heart from going into defib and let go threshold. And you and I did a program on that, which, uh, you know, I'll put a link afterwards. I'll put a link up above here so that if somebody at this point in this video wants to go back and look at that, you can. Uh, but we have a really good video that uh, covers GFCIs and helps you understand that principle. But, you know, it's current going outside of the path. And what, what causes a ground fault? It's uh, Nihad El Sharif and his toaster. <laughs> well, I'm hungry, Tom. I'm a hungry guy. Like yeah, meat. yeah. You know, there's but you have a lot of different reasons you might have a ground fault, either in equipment. And or... you know, I couldn't even cover all the uh, causes of a ground fault on this slide, so I figured I'd just share some. Just like to find some uh, interesting images for for our audience. But the the main reason for a ground fault is the uh, insulation is compromised. So you have a problem in your insulation. And this can be caused by different reasons. So Tom, I guess, is zooming in on the aging uh, and physical damage of a conductor. If you have a conductor, it's getting old. It's, you know, there's physically damage or there is uh, some kind of a, you know, like it's it just like the insulation basically is wearing out. So this cause a connection, could, could, could cause a connection to ground, which is the ground fault. Like Tom explained the definition in the previous slide. So this could be one reason, aging, uh, physical damage, uh, lightning and uh, high voltage, over voltages. Lightning and over voltages stress your, your uh, dielectric, your insulation, like insulation is a dielectric material. So if you stress the dielectric material enough, it could lose its uh, insulation probability and becomes conductive. And when it conducts, then it just conducts current to ground. So the current is not uh, confined into your conductor anymore. It can kind of more of a, I think they believe, I believe they call it flash over. It kind of goes over the conductor surface and goes to ground. So this is very problematic. Uh, another cause for another thing that could compromise your uh, your uh, insulation is moisture. If you're like in, uh, you know, like in, in the NEC and Canadian Electric Code, we always talk about wet, you know, uh, wet environments and and damp environments or damp location, wet locations. So could, this is the reason moisture would just compromise the insulation of conductors. 
would, could, could lead to a hazard, a ground fault hazard. And uh, another thing that could do the same is chemicals. If you have some chemicals, like the petrochemical industry is, you know, like all the uh, 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 hazardous location that they have like the classification and division, those chemicals can affect, uh, negatively impact your uh, your insulation of your conductors. So again, it could lead to a ground fault protection. So a ground fault uh, a condition. Conductive dust is very popular condition as well. If you have like, this is kind of image I, I found online, this has different kind of dust in different industries. And this dust is conductive, so it can conduct the current to ground, creating a ground fault. And this is kind of, you got to love these guys, like rodents and raccoons. Yeah. They just like insulation. It's cold. It's snowing outside. We're in Saskatoon here, like as we speak. So these guys are cold and they just like to show on the insulation. It's just like, it's, it's their, uh, you know, their, their dessert, their snack. They snack on yeah. our insulation and then they just create a ground fault. So uh, this is kind of, this is more like, I guess I would say, I would group all those uh, reasons or those causes into the compromise, uh, compromising your insulation. But there's another important reason for ground faults, which is human intervention. You know, Tommy, Tommy you probably heard or seen cases when, you know, uh, someone is working or doing some maintenance and they drop a tool and it causes a ground fault right. or they can just improperly handle the conductors or even worse, you know, when you're doing maintenance, there's safety ground. So you ground all the, uh, I guess, conductors to make sure that, I guess, Jim Dollard, would, Timmy would just say, establish a work, a safe work condition, safe workplace condition, right? For okay. 70E. And those safety grounds, it shouldn't happen, but, you know, we're for forgetful. You want to forget. So yeah. if someone forgets the safety ground on the system, when, so they put them down, they de energize and then they con connect them, de-energize, make sure that there's no fault on the system, but if they must be removed, right, before they re-energize the system. So if someone forgets those safety grounds, you have a bolted fault on your system. That's right, so yeah. And that's a bolted reason. ground fault, absolutely. Yeah. Now, so what- So this, this is like human intervention, yeah. Yeah, now the other thing from, now these are the causes of ground fault. Now, when you look at the National Electrical Code, 23095 in, in article 240 215 and 210 have ground fault protection of equipment requirements in the code and that all began back in the the 60s 50s and 60s and and this IEEE paper so for those of you out there who are IEEE members if you are an industry application society member you can download these uh these uh IEEE papers cuz these are from the IAS uh, society and um and if you're not an, I, an IEEE member, you would have to purchase them. But Dunkey Jacobs uh, published a paper in 1972 called Arcing Burn Downs Rel Relatively Recent uh, or uh, the Effects of Arcing Ground Faults on Low Voltage System Design. Because it was in the 60s and, and, and where they started to have burn downs of service entrance equipment. And Dunkey Jacobs, in his paper, nailed down the reasons why they were resulting in these arc flash events that we were seeing at service entrance equipment. He noted three issues. One was there was a gradual change from the ungrounded delta delta systems. They went from ungrounded systems to solidly grounded systems. Now, why did we love ungrounded systems? Back back in the day when we when electricity was first out there, really it was it was used for uh, industrial applications where we were driving motors. We were driving loads that did not operate single phase. They were leveraging the three phase systems. They weren't leveraging a ground. They didn't have to be grounded. Uh, the ungrounded systems were um, much more reliable because the first ground fault was a gimme, right? But they were having issues with three ungrounded systems and, and you know what's what's one of the biggest problems that you have in an ungrounded system they had over voltages yeah, just, yeah and you uh, over voltages and then fault escalation if your first fall like tom said the first ground fall so ungrounded systems were great because like tom was saying they were good that when you have a ground fault on your system as, as, as long as it's a ground fault not a double line to ground because it could escalate you can continue running so this was great continuous operation like processes that they just don't want to interrupt power 
because we, on solid ground the system that we have today, if you have a ground fault, you need to interrupt power right away. Like it does, it's, it's not as forgetful, but ungrounded systems were more forgetful when, when you have a first ground fault. But the problem is the fault escalation and insulation failure because of the uh, transient voltages. Neutral instability, like the neutral eleva is elevated, and it's uh, like the neutral is not sitting on zero or ground potential anymore. It elevates to uh, your line voltage, uh, mm -hmm. line to ground voltage, and this kind of stresses all your insulation. Right, and and it, you would they insulation. they would experience down. motor failures and all that good stuff. It's fault so, escalation because you instead of having a, a ground fault that was pretty much has no current, zero current. Now you can have a double line to ground or even three phase to ground fault that just has a lot of current going through ground. Right. So, then so the, the uh, motors. Yeah. Yep. So they, so they had, they, they were migrating from ungrounded to grounded systems because they were, the perception was the grounded systems were more reliable, but yeah. with the grounded systems, they had other issues, right? So uh, you had a higher fault currents. That first fault current was a doozy because your system is already grounded. Now, the next thing that they did was they went from 208 average of a 208 volt system and they were migrating over to 480 volt system. So first you grounded the system, then we increased the voltage of the system. And what voltage is, if I would relate this to a mechanical thing, voltage is pressure, right? So right. pressure pushing that current into the system. So you went from a grounded 208 volt system or an ungrounded 208 volt system to a grounded 480 volt system. And that was primarily because of economical necessity. They had increased load densities and whatnot that drove the voltages up. And then finally, yeah. the coup de gras was a gradual change from a lower interrupting current rating, uh, which would be on a six, say an average of a 600 amp service to a four upwards of a 4,000 amp service. And what that does is that pushes the instantaneous further out there for highest cur higher currents. So you went to grounded systems, you increase the voltage to 480, you increase the size of the service devices, and then what that did was the arcing ground faults that were occurring in that equipment were taking longer to clear and you were having arc flash events. The, uh, the other thing he pointed out was that on the 208 volt systems, and, and I'm not sure if I totally agree with uh, his, one of his, um, um, one of his uh, conclusions was that uh, he said that the, uh, at 208 volts, that they didn't have enough uh, power to sustain themselves. The arcing currents did not have enough to sustain themselves. Now I know IEEE 1584, we know a lot more about arc flash events these days and 1584 and whatnot, and we are doing more studies around uh, single phase systems. We're gonna be doing more testing in that regard, but we know that these 208 volt systems can still sustain themselves. But those were the three things that drove the, a lot of the requirements. And that's why ground fault protection of equipment is only required at 480 volt systems and not 208 volt systems, because the 208 volt systems weren't having arc flash events. It was the 480 volt systems and the grounded 480 volt systems that were. Now. Uh, these... A quick question. You mentioned uh, Donkey Jacob. Uh, this art, this paper is really good. But if anyone listening to us is interested in learning more about power system, Donkey Jacob has a great book. I believe it's called Industrial Power System. It's really, really good, and it describes this whole thing. I, yeah. I guess it was more of a collection of papers that Donkey Jacob and there are two other co-authors uh, of this book that just published over the years. So yeah, I... have access to. Like, First, you can get this book. It's a very good book. I have it here. Yep, I have one too. I'll, we'll try to get this, the specific title at the end of the program. These were yep. two examples of where he showed the bolted fault current value versus the arcing current values. So what you see is that he, now this is 1971, before uh, IEEE 1584, before everything that we know about incident energy, he was plotting the arcing currents as it relates to the bolted fault current values. And and he was showing the problem that they were experiencing in these arc flash events that uh, that we know a lot more about today. But in any case, uh, it was just, this just an interesting uh, uh, IEEE paper. Now, another one, he came back in 86 and he published the escalating arcing ground fault phenomenon uh, or phenomena, whatever you want to say it. This was in 1986 and he, uh, 
shared with the world that the arcing line to ground faults initiated when it's initiated in proximity to those three what you think about when you have an arcing event inside of a piece of equipment the what you get is a ionizing gases that occur which are very conductive and and you mentioned it nihad that current will flow through the air and what he noted was that that ionizing gas makes it such that that fault goes, that ground fault will go to a three phase fault in about one or two cycles of time. Not a but, a bout. There's an O missing in that, in that lesson. But, but in any case, what he, so what he showed was that that arcing ground fault goes ballistic basically within one to two cycles, which there are a lot of IEEE papers that talk about the settings of ground fault protection of equipment and how important it is that, you know, you're really weighing uh, selectivity with downstream equipment and protection of your service equipment. And, and, you know, in 1971, that's the only technology that we had. Industrial Power Systems Grounding Design Handbook by Ducky Jacobs. That's exactly right, Mohammed. Very good reference and resource for you. Yeah, it's yep. Industrial Power Systems. Yeah, a very good reference. Very good I book. Recommend. Yep. Now, another good IEEE paper is the... Um, the one on predicting damage from 277 volt single phase to ground arcing faults because, and this was in 77, because you think about history in, in 71, Dunkey Jacobs came out and said, you know, it's hard to sustain a 208 volts or in single and, and three phase systems that that low voltage. Um, and what happens on single full phase? What are the, what are some, what's the math behind this? So what Harris Stanback did in 77, his pub paper was published in July, August of 77. He did lab testing and he showed uh, what happens in ground faults in this equipment. And he came up with some equations as well. And what's really interesting, if you calculate the arcing currents that he came up with based upon test data, it's really not that far off from the equations that we use today in uh, in 1584, IEEE 1584, which is the standard that we use to calculate incident energy. Now, Tom, these guys are pioneers. It's just pioneers, absolutely. Things. And you know what, Nihad, you're a pioneer there today. 20 years, 30 years from now, we're going to be talking about your papers, just like we're talking about Donkey Jacobs. Someone's going to uh, say, I you know, know that that Nihad El Sharif, that L guy, boy, he was something else. Yeah, I guess we need to publish more papers, Tom, so people can talk about both of us. I know we got to get them approved. So ground fault types. So you have you have low impedance faults, you have high impedance faults, and we we talked a little bit. You know that's what Junky Junky Jacobs and 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 crew learned is that the amount of current that will flow is going to be dependent upon the impedance in the system. Yeah. And and you mentioned it where you had if you leave the bonding straps in, that's a direct ground fault. That is a very low impedance fault, very rare, but a very low impedance fault. But the rest of them have some level of impedance, which reduces their values. So, so the thing is, Tom, so like you said, absolutely correct. Low impedance is high current, right? It's like you can call it low impedance uh, ground faults, which means high current. So those kind of ground faults are not problematic because for the most part, because they're high, low impedance, right? High current, they're probably going to be uh, detected by your OCPD, overcome protective device, whether you're using a breaker or a fuse, because the current is high enough. So the breaker or the fuse will probably pick it up. You will get into problems when we talk about high impedance, arcing ground faults. The stuff that Donkey Jacob and and, the, and and those guys, the paper that Tom just mentioned, were experiencing in the 70s because the problem is it's high impedance, which means low current. So the uh, circuit breaker or the fuse would never ever pick on those currents because it's just too low. It's just way lower. It's much less than the pickup value of those uh, of your OCPD. So this was the reason, the main reason that originated the need for ground fault protection of equipment because your overcurrent device, OCPD, cannot detect those kind of faults. The one other uh, example or other type of fault that is, uh, it's kind of more specific, but it was might as well mention it. It's kind of out of the scope of this paper, of this uh, presentation, but we can do another uh, session on it, Tom. It's uh, high resistance grounded. Faults. So they are kind of ground faults that have set amount, usually five amperes or 10 amperes. And the reason is in those systems, high resistance grounded systems, 
you have a resistor connected, a high resistance, or high resistance, or a resistor with a high value mm -hmm. connected between router and ground. So now, because of the high resistance connected between router and ground, the ground fault current is controlled by this resistor. You can neglect pretty much all the impedances in your system, and this will be the controlling element of your ground fault. And okay. usually, they're designed to have a five ampere ground fault or 10 ampere ground faults for different reasons. Again, it's not really our topic today, but something we can, Tom and I can maybe cover in another. Uh, sure. Yeah. Another presentation. Yeah, I'd love if to talk about more, impedance grounded systems. Mics, yeah. If we get more mics, we can do it. Yeah. Yeah. We, I'd love to talk about it. And, and, and then, and so this gets into the discussion of how do you detect these ground faults? And I, and, and I know you put some of these images together, which I, I really uh, appreciate you. You can show that the ground fault relay could be in that ground circuit and not in the phase A, B, and C. So now you you're simply monitoring what's going to ground at that point. Right. So this is kind of the ground return method, and it just you know again it's just looking for any current going through the connection between neutral and ground, like the image is showing. And the reason, the premise of this uh, method is, you know, for a, a, a power system, a balanced power system, all the currents like the phase currents and the neutral current should add up to zero. The only time that there should be that there is current going through the neutral to ground, like this link that we have the relay shown as Tom is showing, is when there's a ground fault. So this is the whole point. This pro this this method has some challenges. So A, you need to have you must have access to your neutral point of the so the neutral, the X uh, uh, con uh, con the uh, X node or connector of your uh, transformer or generator. You need to have access. It's not the access is not available all the time. Sometimes you can't access your neutral connection. And even if you have access, the second problem is, you know, in ideal systems, we don't we neglect uh, capacitive coupling. But when you have long conductors, like the phase conductor that we're showing, they're actually connected to ground through capacitors, like charging current and capacitances. So if there's any unbalance in the charging currents, this current would go where? It would go back to the source through your ground connection to the neutral. So those capacitive currents could trip your relay. So the relay would see, oh, there is current, I'm going to trip. So uh, this is a problem. So most most industrial, most uh, practical systems using this method would filter out uh, the capacitive component and make their decision, the tripping decision, based on the uh, resistive uh, component only. Yep. And Just to avoid short problem, imbalance, charging imbalance. Absolutely. So that's, that's a challenge here. We got uh, Robert from Omaha joined us. Thanks for joining us, yeah, Robert. Sure. So uh, we got this one here is what, and I showed a picture of this in that fusible switch. That's your zero sequence CT that goes through ABC and neutral, but not the equipment grounding conductor. That's another important thing is you do not pull the equipment grounding conductor through that zero sequence CT. We're talking about this too, but the, the point is, so the thing is you must have all the current carrying conductors going through your uh, your CT window, uh, the core balance of zero sequence method to use this method. And some cases, if you don't have a neutral, if you don't have line to ground, uh, sorry, line to neutral nodes, you don't have the neutral, you don't have, the neutral doesn't have to go through. But if you have any, Line to ground, uh, line to neutral or single phase load, then the neutral must go. And you know, again, the the idea is, in an ideal system or in a healthy system, when there's no problem, all the current should add up to zero, right? Right. Because of the phaser, no whatsoever. So there's no magnetic field. Uh, the, all the magnetic fields of all the phase currents and the neutral current would cancel each other, which means that you don't have any induced voltage on the secondary of your uh, current transformer. Thus. The relay connected to the secondary of the transformer, the brain, remember from the previous slides, is not going to see any signal, which means everything is good. When there is any uh, unbalance or this balance uh, of the current going through the current transformer window is disturbed for whatever reason, then it's probably a ground fault. And then the relay gets a signal proportional to the imbalance happening between those currents, which is translated to a ground fault value. And then the relay would make a decision based on you know, the setting and how it's programmed and everything. Yeah, so Felix Sandoval has a question. He says, so an overcurrent protective device, like a, like a multi case circuit breaker, won't detect ground fault and won't clear it. Now, that's not necessarily true, Felix, because a ground fault current can be high enough that a circuit breaker can detect it. And that's when you have a very low impedance fault. But... 
if you have a very, say, a very long run circuit uh, where you have conductors going out in a long uh, distance and you have a ground fault down further in the distribution system, you can have very low currents flowing to ground and the thermomagnetic circuit breaker is going to respond based upon its trip curve. So, you know, this is a, 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 a a, uh, I'm not sure. This is actually a power circuit breaker, but you know I can have. Uh, this is a 800 amp, so that's 800 amps worth of, uh, of of protection, and this instantaneous pickup isn't up until 21,000 amps. If I have a ground fault that's less than 800 amps, it's definitely not going to open. Uh, and if I have a ground fault that's in uh, this region, say around 2,000 amps. Or, uh, or or 3,000 amps, it's going to take a very long time to clear, uh, which could increase damage. And and the co National Electrical Code tells us that we need to have at least a one second clearing time above a certain value of current. Uh, but but the what our discussion is basically saying, look, you can have a, a condition where the current that's flowing to ground is low enough such that you need some other method to detect it, to open it, to clear it, so you eliminate the possibility of damage. Now, you're going to remember the problem that they were trying to solve were these arc flash events on service entrance equipment. We have ground fault protection of equipment requirements elsewhere, like on um, in marinas, in uh, on heat trace tape, and whatnot. So there are other places down close to the load. We have... Well, so here's an example, Nihad. We have ground fault protection of equipment requirements in Article 434 motors. But we don't right. put GFPE. We get that done with the overcurrent protective device itself. So yeah. to answer Felix's question or his statement, you know, uh, that an overcurrent protective device won't detect ground fault, it, it can and, it, and it, it can detect. And if it's high enough, it will detect it and clear it. It just needs you know, to be Tom, high enough. I say, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Eaton and all the breaker manufacturers, they have special modules for ground fault protection. So you can order, you can, the multi kisser breaker won't have it because it's specifically for overcurrent protection. It's not designed for ground fault protection, but I guess some models you probably, you guys probably have that you can order that has the uh, ground fault function that you were showing one of the uh, Yep. I guess the uh, data sheets before. Yep. That's so this, this, uh, and I left that up. This was from uh, an earlier discussion that Nihad and I were having just before we got on. Uh, and I was going to throw some of these in the PowerPoint, but in this case here, this is a thermal magnetic circuit breaker. And we put a, a module on the bottom of it, which provides that uh, earth leakage uh, detection. And, and the uh, milliamps is 30 milliamp trip level. So, the, uh, it can be adjusted down to 30 milliamps, and you can adjust it up as well. So a lot of people have the misconception that ground fault protection of equipment is 30 milliamps. Not not true, because ground fault protection of equipment in Article 230 is that is is at uh, a maximum of 1200 amps. So when you're talking GFPE, you're talking amps. But we we will use milliamps as you know as one of those uh, trip thresholds. Uh, we also have. Um, you know, we have the GFPE built into thermomagnetic circuit breakers as well, just like GFCIs, but these are uh, ground fault equipment protection at 30 milliamps, and that's set at 30 milliamps. You can't change it. So, um, you know, so to, to Felix's point and, and to others who might, you know, question that, you know, what, what's, what's availability and all that good stuff, this, what we're talking about right here, this zero sequence, uh, or... Or this one here, where we're putting CTs in every phase, these different methods of detection can sometimes be included in these devices, like um, like we were just showing over here, right? So this device here that's that clamps on at the bottom of of this circuit breaker is employing one of these methods that we're talking about. In these diagrams, these individual sensors, or or this one zero sequence sensor, a lot of times that is built right into the overcurrent protective device if it's all self-contained. Once you, you... Tom, to your point, 
to your point, the core balance method is more dominant in medium voltage systems because we, you know you have the conductors and you can feed them through the uh, the, the the window of the or the donut of the circuit the, of the current transformer. Which kind of this is kind of a good segue for the second for this method, the residual current or differential current. And I mean, before we even talk about it, you someone can say, you know what? Why would I have four different CTs to do the same job that I could do with one current transformer, like in the previous method, right? It just it feels like it looks like a waste of money. But actually, this this method method is more proper in the low voltage systems. I'm I'm guessing, I don't know the design, but I'm guessing the the multi case circuit breaker that Tom was showing will probably implement those methods, that specific method that we're showing now, the residual current. And the reason is because of the overcurrent functionality. You need to have a, a sensor, a current transformer for every phase, right? So the sensors are there already. Like it's different for medium voltage. You're not buying four different current transformers for each phase. No, like this, the, you have the sensors already for overcurrent protection. So once you connect them in this scheme that we're showing on the Tom is showing on the screen, this method can be this connection can be used to detect uh, ground fault protection. Again, the idea is we have all four current transformers, the, the three phase uh, current transformers and the neutral, if, if present, they were connected such that the current is added to zero because all the current are balanced, right? So they add up to zero. Again, the ground fault relay at the bottom is not going to see any current and you are good. Once you have a problem, like Tom always says, it's ungood. <laughs> That's right. West Virginia accent, it's ungood to have a ground fault current, right? So then the relay would get a signal similar to the core balance. Again, you know, there for each every method there is an application. This is more medium uh, low voltage. The previous method was more of the uh, uh, low voltage. Uh, the previous method was the medium voltage, uh, more dominant. Again, there's you know nothing is perfect. There's the problem here with this method with the residual current is current transformer matching. Because think about it, if those current transformers have some uh, mismatch, which means like the, the, they can generate some residual or circulating current, this current could be high enough to trip your breaker, right? So this is more like the manufacturer kind of like, like for example, Ethan, when they design this, they have to make sure that, that their C current transformers are matching and there's no circulating current in this loop because of the mismatch between the magnetic properties of the current transformer. Yep, absolutely if right. Doing it, like if you're like buying four separate CTs from four separate manufacturers and try to connect them this way, most likely they're going to trip, nuisance trip because of the mismatch between the CTs. Even from the same manufacturer, you know, different patches would have different magnetic characteristics. So any slight difference could just cause the uh, the uh, the ground fault to trip because of the circulating current in this loop. Yep. Now let's take a look at let's take a look at now we have that in practice. So we have the we talked about the different methods to detect ground fault. Now let's take a look at a power system and how it's wired in and how they, they, they function, because it's all about the flows of current in the power system. Right, so this is a simple system. So I'm just kind of showing here, you know, like a, a typical three phase industrial motor, a load, three phase load. And then we have a line to ground, like a, a lighting load, a line to neutral uh, uh, load. Uh, at, you know, during normal operation, let's think of what are the currents going through the current transformer. So. We know that for for the for the three phase load, the motor, the 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 summation of all three phase currents is supposed to be zero, right? Because it's a balanced system, so there's no current uh, technically inducing any voltage during the, uh, through the CT window. What about this IL? Like it's a, I can't I can't point to it, but the the red line, the I load, which is the single phase load current going through the current transformer. If you notice, it's going one way and then it's returning through the current transformer back to the source. In the same direction, so this has the effect of canceling out. So you have one the IL going in one direction, and the same IL going back through the current transformer in the same in the opposite direction. So the magnetic fields of those two currents would cancel each other, and the system should be happy because there is no output uh, induced voltage that, that, to trigger your relay. Right. So this and is the normal. Everything has to stay in the path, and as long as everything goes through that donut hole. And comes back in that on those conductors, everything will be balanced, and all of your phases, all of your your magnetic fields will cancel out. Right. And another thing to keep in mind, which we're going to be discussing uh, maybe in a couple of slides more, 
uh, you know, there's only upstream of the current transformer, you have your switch, uh, your switch gear ground, it's shown here, or your uh, service entrance, if you're like, you know, in the residential or NEC world, you kind of have the ground lug. So there's only this connection must be upstream or to the left of your current transformer for a reason that we're going to discuss in three or four slides more. But just keep this in mind, there's only one ground and this ground must be upstream of your current transformer. So now this one shows what happens when you have a fault in the system. So the previous showed all the currents going through that donut and everything was balanced. Now I've got current going outside of the normal path and you have an imbalance now in that uh, that CT. Right, because it's by, the, the return current is by is the fault current. The return of the fault current to the source is bypassing the current transformer, which means that IF is going in one direction, but it, there's no cancellation of this IF going through the current transformer window, which means that there are going to be some voltage signal induced on the secondary of the current transformer, triggering your relay to detect a ground fault. Yep. Pretty simple, and it's the same. It is the same principle of uh, GFCIs. We discussed this the in the other uh, absolutely. Uh, pro it's the now, exact same. But that's why the confusion between GFPE and GFCI, GFCIs. Same principle that the, both of them use. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm as we get into discussion the, to discuss the product standards. Um, Robert from Omaha is asking, what are the classes of ground fault protection, and are they differentiated by milliamp trip thresholds and clearing time? So I think what he's talking about are the class of GFCIs that are out there. You have a class A device, et cetera. Remember, you have your special purpose yeah. GFCI. We don't have that same environment in the 1053 equipment, correct? Yeah, no, and we covered we covered uh, the GFCI classes, and if this is what uh, what uh, Robert is talking about, uh, this is uh, yeah, you, you can definitely refer to the previous uh, program, and we cover the different GFCI classes. Yep, and I'll put a link to that up above for those of you watching later. Uh, there will be a link uh, that you can go look at that one, but that is uh, you're exactly right. Now, UL ten fifty three, and that's a a nine forty three device. That's personnel protection. A ten fifty three device is a ground fault sensing and relaying equipment for ground fault protection of equipment. Right. Which and the... this is the standard that you remember, Tom, when you showed the the questions uh, for the menti uh, menti yep. questions. The second question we were talking about the uh, if there is a specific trip time, you know, for the uh, for ground fault protective relays or equipment. And we said, no, there's only one, one, one person that's supposed to get the mug. We don't know who the person is. So I might just get two mugs, Tom. I'll just get it for, for that person. Uh, so this person was right. And the reason is when we go to the next slide, I said, I'm not gonna go through the whole standard, but I have a screenshot that Tom is showing now. This is the calibration test that any GFPE or ground fault relay manufacturer would have to go through. And this table, Again, it's a screenshot from 1053, UL 1053, tells you what are the uh, the uh, the level, the, 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 the times, uh, the trip times, that the maximum trip times required. So for example, if we think of like, and, and you notice, so the left column is the ground fault current you're measuring in amperes, not milliamperes. You're gonna see this is the ground equipment protection, not GFCI. So we're talking about amperes, not milliamperes. But it could be milliamperes, like Tom said, 30 milliamps, but the standard is set in amperes. And then the right column talks about time. So if your current, ground fault current measured is 85% of your pickup current, you're not supposed to trip. If your current is 115% of your pickup current, then the standard doesn't give you time. You ultimately trip sometime, but it doesn't give you a specific amount of time. But if you have, if you're at 150% of the pickup, Amount, which is the current that you set on your on your relay or the GFPE, then you're supposed to trip or you must trip at maximum of two seconds. You could trip quicker than two, but maximum is two. Any any time any trip time slower or higher than two is a fail. And then if you go up to 250% of your pickup amount, then you trip at one second max. So just to put this in perspective to kind of see what I was trying to Tom and I were trying to share in this question, if you think of let's say your pickup current is one ampere, for example, just for the, for the sake of argument. When you are at 150, which means you are at 1.5 amperes, right? You're supposed to trip at two seconds max. But what if your pickup is two amperes? 
then you're not supposed to, you trip at two seconds when your current is 1.5 multiplied by two, which is five amperes, right? Mm -hmm. So this is kind of, for, for GFCIs, there is a curve and there is specific time that you trip based on the current that you're measuring because it's all related to let go and ventricular fibrillation, human, uh, our you know sensitivity to current. For equipment, it's not that sensitive. So it's a function of the pickup current. So depending on your pickup current, the time will be set. So you can trip at two seconds when your ground fault is five amperes or 20 amperes or 100 amperes, or even when you go to the utility kind of environment, you can even trip in the kilo amperes, like thousand amperes because of, yep. you know, the different system and design. So 1053 is, is, is written as a ratio, as a percentage of your pickup amount, which you set and it's different. Right, so that that is amount of time. That pickup set point is determined by either the manufacturer. So that mold decay circuit breaker that we have, that that the you know very small miniature breaker that says thirty milliamps. We said we're going to set it at thirty milliamps. I could have my competitor might say, well, my GFPE trips at fifty milliamps. There's nothing in the National Electrical Code outside of Article Five Fifty Five. Uh, if you go into the heat trace, it doesn't tell you it has to be 30 milliamps. It's just an industry settled on 30 milliamps as something that works. But there's nothing in the code like for heat trace tape that says it has to be 30 milliamps. It just says ground fault protection of equipment. And we know that that pickup has to be less than the handle rating. Now, uh, so the set that trigger point can be deter is determined either by my myself or as a manufacturer, or it's determined by the relaying engineer or whoever it is that's setting the relay. So I might publish a, a uh, protective relay that uh, provides ground fault protection of equipment that's settable from, uh, you know, from 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 20 amps up to uh, 1200 amps, uh, and you'll have to dial it in to whatever it is. But if you say, for example, the National Electrical Code in 23095 says that um, the maximum setting of the ground fault protection shall be 1200 amps. Well, if I put my 1200 amps and I set it at 1200, that means that based on this at 115%, which it would, would ultimately trip, which means I'm gonna go out for lunch and come back and it should be uh, opened by the time I get back, that's at 1380, right? So at um, 150%, that will be at 1800 amps uh, that it will trip in two seconds. So, and, and as you get higher in, in current, so uh, at 2400 amps, you're gonna be at, uh, at a one second clearing time. So it's all relative to what you trip at. And then on top of all this, we have a trip curve. So these are the maximum. You can adjust the trip curve and we'll plot the bands to, to, to show you uh, approximately when uh, what the maximum and minimum clearing times are going to be for based upon ground fault currents. Right. That is right. All right. So troubleshooting, you want to talk a little bit about troubleshooting? Sure. So again, you know, you know remember when we first started the presentation, we were talking about the, uh, you know, analogy with the uh, airbag, right? Airbag system. So troubleshooting is very important because again, I mentioned that we're, when I were discussing this, that, you know, the, your, your protection system or ground fault protection in this case is just sitting there waiting for a problem to happen, right? The worst, the, the worst thing that could happen to you is your system fails to react when there's a fault because it wasn't maintained, it wasn't troubleshooted, right? And the other reason to, to be able to figure out those troubleshooting is during commissioning, it's required by the Canadian Electric Code and the National Electric Code, uh, section 210.35, uh, 210, uh, sorry, 230.95, requires that you have to do testing, right? During the commissioning. So, you know, if there's a problem, you need to understand the troubleshooting. And we'll be talking about testing a little bit later, but you need to understand what are the common problems for, uh, you know, for, for a ground fault system. Mm -hmm. So what Tom is showing now is, we showed this before. This is the system, a regular system, the ground fault system that, you know, everything is normal. And uh, Tom, if you, I think there is a, a, a red circle that should show up if you press. Next oh yeah, there item. it is. Yeah, yeah, right. Because I wanted to just highlight that this is the grounding uh, 
point of the system. I remember Tom was talking about un uh, ungrounded systems, and then we migrated into grounding, uh, solidly grounded systems. So this is a solidly grounded system, and the grounding point is only must like this grounding point must be like I said before, upstream or to the left of your circuit uh, current transformer, for reasons uh, we're going to be are we sharing now because if you have a ground point or ground connection to the right or downstream of your current transformer, this would cause two problems that we can show in the next slide, two slides. All right. So let's, yeah, just let's take this system, the same system that we were showing in the previous slide, but now we have a ground fault, right? So we have a ground fault on our system. What happens here? And, and notice that the switch, the switch to your uh, uh, ground or your ground connection is moved downstream or to the right of your circuit, uh, of your current transformer, right? So you have, again, the fault current is going in one direction through the current transformer, and then it goes through the ground, uh, the ground fault, but then it goes back. And then at the switch gear uh, uh, point, now we have two passes, right? And you remember ground current, electrons would take all passes available, not the path of least resistance. Any path available, there's always gonna be some electrons, some current going through. So now we have uh, this, uh, ground uh, switch to your ground point, the current would split going back to the uh, source. The de uh, so let's, I'm just kind of using some uh, symbols here. So IFN, which is the fault, the portion of the fault current that's going back to the source on through the neutral. And then the difference is the portion of the fault current going back on the, uh, on the ground, through ground back to the source. So if you just kind of throw some numbers in, let's say your fault current is, let's say 10 amperes, right? For example, so the 10 amperes is the fault current, and then at the split point, let's say uh, only two amperes or three amperes is going back on the neutral, and then the rest, which is like your seven or eight amperes, is going back to the source through the uh, through the uh, the ground, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens here? The current transformer reacts to IF or the difference. It reacts to the difference, right? So I said, like, it's a difference between what's going in one direction and returning to the other direction. So what's going to trigger your your relay is not IF, it's not the 10 amperes, it's actually IF minus IFN. Let's say the difference is 5 amperes, 2 amperes, whatever. So your system would think that the fault current is 5 amperes, not the 10, right? Or, or 2 amperes, not the 10, which means it's going to... It's, it's what we call it's desensitization of your system. Your system is not as sensitive as it used to because instead of detecting IF, 10 amperes, now detecting only two or three. What will be the, the, the side effect of this? First of all, if, you're, if, you, if, the, if the difference between the, the current going one direction and returning to the other direction, which in this our case, let's say two amperes, is less than the pickup value of your current, uh, of the ground fault relay, the relay is not, not going to trip ever, right? Because it's below the pickup current. Remember, mm -hmm. the actual fault current was 10 amperes, but the relay is only reading two. And if it's set at, let's say, to trip at four or five, it's never going to trip. So now you're going to have a ground fault that is like your system is blindsided pretty much, like the ground fault is never going to be detected. But if the difference is high enough, it is, happens to be higher than the pickup current of your ground fault uh, relay or the GFPE and you happen to have an inverse characteristics like Tom was showing all those curves. Now you're measuring, instead of measuring 10 amperes, you're measuring two, right? So your, your relay would trip much slow, slower than it should be because of the inverse characteristics. When you're measuring 10 amperes, you should trip at X amount of time based on the curve that Tom was showing. But if it's two amperes, it's gonna be slower, right? So it just causes desensitization of your system. It could trip at a slower time or it could never trip if you're of your uh, differential current is less than the pickup amount of your uh, of your of your pickup current of your relay. Absolutely. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I we I saw a question in here from where's that? Um, is this ignoring the ground fault delay that we set? So Muhammad is asking about the ground fault delay. And what I'll do is I'll just show uh, on the screen here, this L-shaped curve is your ground fault protection on 
Uh, in this case, it's a CRD. It's an R-frame R breaker, 2,000 amps. And the plug is at 1,200. And my ground fault protection can be set from 0.25 all the ways up to 0.6. So I can move this curve uh, from a pickup perspective. And then this would be my delay. So anything that moves up and down is adding more time because time is up the axis and current is across the bottom. So when I move this curve to the left and right, I'm increasing my pickup setting. And when I move this up and down, I'm increasing or decreasing my clearing times. Now, what we were talking about the standard, that's going to tell you uh, a worst case scenario, right? That's telling you, you can't go beyond this, but I can add faster trip times on these ground fault protection devices. I can lower or raise my uh, settings for current and, and the restrictions on how high I can put this is gonna be based upon the National Electrical Code. Uh, 23095 tells us I can't go above 1200 amps. And it also gives us some guidance with regard to how my longest clearing time because 23095 says that the maximum setting of the ground fault protection shall be 1200 amps and the maximum time delay shall be one second for ground fault currents equal to or greater than 3000 amps. So I would need, there's my one second line. So I can put this, I, and, I, and I'm not even gonna give you this, this relay here, this uh, circuit breaker doesn't even let me go to one second. So I, I'm going to meet this code requirement as long as I keep this pickup point um, at uh, 1200 amps or less. But even at 1200 amps, what those testing points showed you is that when I set this for 1200 amps, my right side of this band is actually going to be higher than 1200 amps because of how it's tested. But, and I have a band. So that's just hopefully answering Muhammad's question about it doesn't, the, the performance from a UL perspective just says, hey, everything on maximum, you can't go higher than this from a, from a clearing time perspective. So that's sort of what, uh, and this is the, say the circuit breaker that this would be on, you know, my circuit breaker clearing, uh, I could have my, my uh, instantaneous is way up there. And this L shaped curve is only going to respond to ground fault currents, not three phase bolted faults, because all that current staying in the path, I've got to, re and, and I've got to respond to imbalanced currents, currents going outside of that path. So hopefully that clears that up for you, um, Muhammad. Yeah, I think Muhammad just posted that he uh, he, he he thought this was uh, he didn't know that this the, the screenshot was showing it was from the standard. So I think he's he's okay now. He got it. Yeah, excellent. And uh, Robert from Aho, thank you so much. He he just commented that uh, the the grounding downstream of a current transformer creates a parallel path, which is absolutely correct. There's a parallel path now. So instead of the current going back to neutral, now you have another parallel path, and the electrons would just split based on the ratio of the impedances, right? The, 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 the path with lower impedance would get more current, but then there's still gonna be some current going through the, path, the other path that has higher impedance. And this is a specific reason. So if we move on to the next uh, problem, so we talked about during fault. So now we're gonna talk about the same system during normal operation and the effect of a ground uh, connection or ground, grounding point uh, downstream of the current transformer. So in this case, again, this is the same load, the same uh, light uh, load, the lamp that we have, line to neutral lamp, and we have the IL, I load, let's say 10 amperes or whatever number you want to in, and it goes through the load and back. Remember, there is no fault. This is no, there's no fault on this system, unlike the previous slide. So what happens again, when you get to the, 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 the switch here, uh, this second ground shown on the system, there is a parallel path, like Robert said. So the current, the load current would split going back to the load. So not all the load current would go back to the current transformer. So now you have a difference. And the difference between the load current and, and the load current going through one direction and returning on the other direction would trigger your, your relay. Basically, this is the, what I'm showing on the curve, uh, on the figure as ILG, which is the portion of the load current that is going back uh, to the source through ground. So this difference is gonna be detected by your uh, current transformer and the system would be fooled thinking that there's a ground fault and it trips when it shouldn't, which is, you know, unwanted tripping, nuisance tripping. Again, this defeats the whole reliability thing. So 
So now your system is not reliable because it's nuisance tripping or doing like the, what we call unwanted tripping when there's no ground fault. And this is kind of the reason that the NEC prohibits having any you know, ground connections downstream of your uh, service entrance or the, uh, like the ground log at the service entrance or the uh, load center, whatever you call it. Uh, th this is not allowed by the NEC. This is a code violation because of those, those reasons that it just defeats the whole purpose of your uh, protection system, or ground fault protection system. Yep. And it gets more complicated too if you have alternative sources, like if you have a, a PV system and things like that, you've got to know where you're terminating on which side of that CT because you've got to account for all of these currents and make sure that you can detect the unbalances. Right, yeah, this is a very simple system, but you know, like Tom said, if you have multiple sources, and multiple loads, it gets way more complicated than this. It's just like a simple one, you know, like a single source, one load to just, you know, explain the uh, idea. And 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 really, I mean, and, and what 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 I like about this in and what our focus is here is to give you a is to give you a foundation. So any situation that you come into with regard to how the more complex things get from say double-ended switch gear, or if you have alternative energy sources and you're looking at the connections, you've got to think about what currents are flowing and where during normal conditions and during faulted conditions and, and recognize your CTs and how they function and operate because no matter what problem and situation you're presented with, if you break it down into simple blocks, you should be able to understand the circuit closer uh, and more when you build upon these basic fundamentals that we're covering. Absolutely, right. So, uh, yeah, so this is the second trouble problem that we could have when we're troubleshooting a system. And this goes back to the, uh, you know, the core balance or the zero sequence method. So usually we, 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 we must, we, we should, we try, of course, it's, sometimes it's hard, but we're supposed to try to have the, car, the cable centered in the window of the current transformer because this would give uh, it becomes more accurate like it's it's you're not like you're not supposed to have the conductors leaning on one side or the one side of the of the current transformer because this could lead to what they call local saturation of your current transformer and then it could just you know loosen strip just be like inaccurate it's not going to be measuring the current going through the conductors correct because of the magnetic fields and how they interact so ideally, the conductor should be just going through the center of the window of the, the circular CT. Sometimes it's if you have a rectangular current transformer, this is impossible. But we try to kind of center the cables, uh, the, the conductor through the, the current transformer somehow, so that we don't get local saturation. Yep. And this is yeah, a. So yeah, and I've seen, I've I've personally seen this issue, and I've also seen it where the CT was labeled incorrectly as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, this is a, a I think I would say, a very popular problem in the industry when you have the polarity of the CTs are incorrect. So I figured, you know, and the polarity of the CTs is set through the dot convention. So I figured, kind of throw this in to kind of refresh everyone's memory of the dot convention. So you have a current transformer. Again, we have a primary and secondary. So the primary, in our case, is the conductor itself, the red arrow going in. And if you're in the IEEE or North American world, we use H1 to refer to the, the, uh, the primary and X1 to refer to the secondary. And you're in Europe or IEC world, it's P1 and S1. So same concept, but the uh, symbols are different. So the dot convention simply says that if your current is going into your dot, into your uh, the primary current is going into the dot, like in this figure, we have the arrow going into the H1 or the P1 uh, primary, the, the dot convention. <coughs> the output current must should be going out of your uh, of your X1 or S1 terminal. So it's going into the dot, coming out of the uh, of the uh, of the X1 or the secondary terminal of your current transformer. This is kind of the way that we the dot convention used to uh, match the polarity of CTs. Now the other, the other, when you get into current transformers, you also have to think about uh, metering class versus relaying class C CTs because a, a metering class CT is designed to be accurate at low current values, but a 
relaying class CT is designed to be more accurate at your higher currents that are flowing through that primary. So uh, that's another area. I know we didn't, we don't have a slide on that one, but uh, that's another thing you have to think about is the class of CT that you're purchasing and make sure that, uh, that, that you match that. Now, the other thing on CTs I've seen is uh, burden calculations. And um, there's probably a lot of people who are watching this that they'll either have heard of a burden calculation or have not heard of a burden calculation, but I've done those on CTs because in some cases, one set of CTs can be used for multiple different relays. And you got to imagine that you can only put so much current out. And if you put too many devices, you won't be able to uh, push that current through those devices and, and, and read accurately. So uh, in, in, I know there's a drive, there's, you know, there's the, the cost sensitive and, and the physical relationship that you can't put, you know, these sensors take up space in the equipment. You may not be able to stack multiple CTs to go to different relays. So you try to leverage one set of CTs for maybe two or three different relays. But if you exceed the burden on those CTs and they'll design those differently, if you put too much load, then you won't get that to operate correctly. You know, there is, you know, current transformers are so simple when you think of what they do, but they're actually not. There is like instrumentation transformers, current transformer, potential transformer. I can't remember the standard uh, number, but there is an IEEE standard. I think it's C37 something, if I remember. Yeah. And it's, it has a lot of details on how to design. There's so much into current transformer and potential transformer than just simply scaling your current down. So, I, I mean, it's not really my area, but there's a lot of, details when it comes to current transformers and the design and saturation and burden like Tom said and classes and yeah. Yep. And you have increased, uh, you have a, a CT polarity when used in residual current methods. Right. So, so that we showed this, uh, this uh, slide before, I mean, this image before, the only difference is now we're showing the dot convention. So if you notice the CTs are connected so that the current, the phase currents and the neutral current is going into the dot to guarantee that the output is in the same direction. So again, they all cancel each other out. But if you flip one of the current transformers accidentally, what happens is you're going to have a circulating current in your loop, which will trigger your, your relay causing unwanted or loosened stripping, thinking that there is a fault. And I heard this during uh, commissioning a lot when they install a new system and it keeps stripping and they think there is a problem in the system which is not really a problem in the system. It's not just a manufacturer problem. Oh, the, the fix is just to flip one of the CTs. Yeah. Once you do that, polarity is corrected and it's, it's bang, it's good. Yeah, and, and, and so whenever you look at 23095 and it talks about performance testing of ground fault protection systems and whatnot, they want you to test these systems when they're first installed to detect these types of issues and if you have a CT polarity issue, you're going to catch that on installation. The same type of testing and the same thought process is uh, it occurs when we think about 24087 for arc reduction and 24067. We use CTs as there's uh, there as well, and there's new requirements that say you need to uh, performance test those when they're first installed. So these details that we're going on over whether it be a labeling issue, the wrong C CT, and et cetera, these are all issues that should be caught on first installation because if you don't catch them and you don't test it, you're not going to know because these things aren't, you know, it may be that you have an imbalance and whatnot, but in some cases you may not, uh, they may not function correctly because, I mean, the, the ratios could be different too. They all have to have the same ratio as well. So yeah, there's I mean if it, if it's if it if it loosens trips uh, uh, during commissioning, it's a good thing because no, you know a problem. The, yep. the, it's worse if it doesn't do anything, and you think that your system is working, but it's not. That's correct. Right? So, yeah. So it, it, you could be like blindsided. All right. So the next slide, Tom, and we thought we discussed this before the presentation as well. Look, and this is very a straightforward one. Uh, conductor emission, right? So. This is the core balance, the same slide that we used. And we said that all four conductors, including the neutral, if it's present, must go through the C, uh, must be passed through the CT window. So Tom, if you just click, I guess, enter. Yeah, so let's say in this case, the uh, phase C is missing. What's gonna happen? All the currents going through the current transformer do not add up to zero anymore, which means there is uh, uh, induced voltage on the secondary of your current transformer triggering your ground fault relay, tripping the system, 
thinking there's a ground fault, but there's no ground fault. It's just a commissioning problem. Right. One of the phases or the neutral was missing. Yep. Now the other, the other side of this, which I don't think we have it in here, but if you put like, say your supply side bonding jumper or, or, or one of your bonding jumpers through that window as well, that now you've included A, B, C, neutral, and your equipment grounding conductor, and that would be ungood too, right? You know, Tom, we have it. I think it's not the next oh. slide. It's the, the one, the app, the equipment grounding conductor, not the next one, the one after. Okay, this okay. Is, I, I couldn't find an image here. It's simply direction of neutral and phase conductors. This kind of relates to the, uh, you know, the dot convention thing. If you're installing conductors, you kind of have to go through all the phase conductor and the neutral in one direction through the current transformer, like you can just have the phase conductors from one direction and then the neutral is set from the opposite direction. This would, again, because of the magnetic fields would cause no sense stripping. So you have to make sure that they are all fed, all the conductors are going, you know, through the current transformer in the same direction. Yep, and make sure you're, and that would, if you had the reverse on your polarity, it would be the same issue, right? Because your, your CT would think that the conductor's in the wrong direction. So same deal. It's similar, but this is for core balance, like one CT, the other, this, the residual current, the polarity was multiple current transformers. And this is the last one we want to discuss, and Tom already kind of talked about it. Oh, so yeah, that's right. If there's a ground fault going, if there's a ground fault, it should go through ground, which means going through the equipment ground, the conductor, the EGC, back to the source, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have, if someone accidentally passes the equipment ground, the conductor through the current transformer window, guess what happens? all the current would add up to zero, right? Because right. the ground fault is now returning to the current transformer, so it cancels everything out, blinds your system. It would never see a ground fault and thinks everything is good, but there's, like Tom said, it's ungood because there's a ground fault on the system. Okay, so Mather, Mr. Abbasi, and, and you know what, Mather, I, I saw that too. He is... Uh... He is pointing out something I think he is right. Your IN should be going the other direction. Yeah, you know, I, I agree. You know, this is kind of what I was thinking, but this image, I took it from the, uh, I think the IEEE Green Book, and they do this because the the, I, the, uh, the neutral current shown is negative, so it's a negative sign not shown on the diagram would flip your direction, because, yeah, you are correct. It's going, the return current is going to the neutral, so if we're doing the... Uh, direction it should be returning but i guess the ieee convention that they use is to have all the currents going one direction as the positive direction but the neutral is negative so there's a sign that flips the direction i, I get that part but this is like i said it's the ieee convention i just stuck with the same uh you know the termina terminology that they use but yeah you are correct all the currents going to the load would be returning on the neutral like you cannot you don't have any source current going from the neutral to the load it's returning that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and I saw that and I, I was, I was sitting there thinking I was going to say something, but I, I just didn't want to go down a rabbit hole and, and Mr. Abbasi picks it up and he's, he's right that, and, and I understand where you're coming from because it's all about the convention. If you, but you have to take this into perspective when you're reading that IEEE book on, right. on, cause they describe why that is. So grabbing a snapshot out, I can understand why, uh, but, but he's sharp. He picked it up. No, it, it's, you know, good point. And it, yep. it's, no, it's no different than when you have, let's say, uh, a reference and you say if you go up the reference, it's positive, like above the reference is positive and then below it's negative. It's the same thing. Like the reference in the IEEE, the, the neutral would be negative. And I guess we know where the next mug is going. <laughs> so, I guess I mean, Mohammed, you know, I tell you what, Mohammed, I, 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 I'm going to send Mohammed the link to where I buy those mugs and he can just uh, ship that over to my, Mr. Mathur Abbasi's got one coming anyway. So I'll just say all of these are adding up to that cup that he should have got about six months ago. Right. <laughs> you have to work hard for your cup, right? Yes. Now understanding all of those diagrams, understanding the CT polarities, how things are wired, and to Don Gineer's point about the shielding and the, on the medium voltage cables, what can go through the zero sequence CT, what can't go through the zero sequence CT. If you understand all of those little details, the testing of this equipment and commissioning becomes a little easier because now 
you know, I call it getting your head in the game. Now your 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 head is in the game with regard to uh, the proper wiring and all that good stuff. So, right. um, and you know, the tech thing is simply what we're going to go through here is just how to find the problem we just discussed. So the first problem is, you know, neutral insulation resistance. So when you have this uh, ground connection downstream from your current transformer, so it's just a schematic. You just what you do is you open the uh, jumper between the neutral and ground on the uh, on your uh, service entrance or switch here and then just with an ohmmeter measure the impedance between the neutral point and the ground uh, you know it's the recommendation is anything less than one mega ohm is indicates that there's a problem so your insulation the resistance you measure should be higher quite but much higher actually than one mega ohm and if you measure anything less than one mega ohm this means that there's a ground downstream of the current transformer somewhere. Yep. All right. So, uh, you know, this is kind of an interesting point, and this goes back to one of the questions that we had: the primary and current and secondary injection. How to measure? How to test your system? So, primary injection is simply with this schematic here. We try to, uh, you know, inject. Uh, 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 a, 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 a fault current, a real fault current injected between line and and ground or non neutral because the ground and neutral ground the neutral and ground are connected. So, for example, you would just you know there is a ground fault tester that I'm showing here that will be connected between let's say point A one and N one, the phase one phase phase A and phase and uh, neutral phase B and neutral C and neutral and see if your system trips because you know what fault you fault cut you're injecting. And now we can, you know, test the uh, response of your current transformer, of your uh, protection system in general, and see if it trips based on the fault you're, you know, you're uh, you're injecting or not. This is some of the equipment now, you know, and I have uh, I have a few other pictures too of um, equipment that was just looking for this, and you know what I'm going to do, Nihad. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about these two, and I'm going to go grab. Uh, the power, the slide deck that I have on 24087, where I, because some of the same equipment is used for that that we use for GFPE. So, yeah, for sure. So these are just generic uh, uh, testers, primary current ejection testers that I found online. Uh, it's just simply an auto transformer, and it's designed to generate around thousand amperes, sometimes even higher than thousand amperes, at low voltage, 2.5 volts or something, and this current is injected directly into your system to simulate a ground fault. Remember the NEC, when Tom was reading from the NEC, uh, section 230.95 talks about 1200 amperes and 3000 amperes. So you need to have a device that is capable of injecting such high current into your system to uh, test your ground fault uh, uh, protection of equipment, the GFPE, uh, during commissioning. And of course, if you're trying to maintain your system, it's always good to test, we don't, we don't have test and reset buttons like GFCIs for those systems. So you're gonna have to test it somehow and maintain it. Yep, so this is a, this is an example of a piece of equipment. It's a PCI 600. It can put output up to 1200 amps. I wonder why they have 1200 amps, right? Because GFPE requirements. Yeah. It's about the size of a briefcase and very easy to use and set up in the field. So if that's all you need, if you think about ground fault protection of equipment, uh, it, 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 the code tells us you can't go higher than 1200 amps anyway, but you still would probably need higher than 1200 amps. But if it's an 800 amp device, 600 amp device, whatever that set point is, you can inject enough current to uh, primary, primary current injection, which is through the CTs, because you're checking for polarity. This is a uh, DDA 1600, can put out 16,000 amps, but look, it's on wheels. It's a much bigger, and there's another one, which I thought I had a picture of in here. I, it's called the Phoenix, and um, it might be a part of my other uh, presentation, so hold on one second. Um, it's probably my 24087 uh, presentation, and I, and, I, and I included these in the 24087 and 24067 because we have to performance test uh, those products as part of that solution. So, uh, and this talks about the CTs and, and you know, understanding the class of CTs and understanding the polarity of those CTs. And that's just a picture of, of uh, current transformers that you might have uh, depending upon the application and the size, right? 
Um, where's my, there we go. Yeah, this has all three of them. So there's your PCI 600, 600. there's the DDA 1600, and then you've got the Phoenix, up to 75,000 amps we can put out. Now that that device, you'll notice it has, um, it has hooks that you would, you know, lift it and put it somewhere. So you're not wheeling this out to a job site. But uh, the primary current injection testing can be done uh, in, in that manner. Now, this is a, a picture. I think it's just a picture, not a video, of primary current injection testing on that Phoenix. You'll notice there's like a, a connection on a bus where the back of that breaker is plugged into that, uh, and it's on a dolly. And he would basically plug that in. It will inject current. It'll test the phase. It'll test the, you know, your short time, your, your instantaneous, your long time pickup and all that good stuff on this power breaker. Um, and then there is the, uh, just a close up of that, uh, of that circuit breaker and the way the testing is done. But in any case, um, the, uh, you know, these test units can be used and, and test that functionality and do primary conjection testing because 23095 says, the ground fault protection system shall be performance tested when first installed on site. This testing shall be conducted by a qualified person using a test process of primary current injection in accordance with instructions uh, that shall be provided with the equipment. So uh, in the past, we were able to just press a button on the front of the breaker and it would do secondary current injection testing. But what we need now is primary current injection testing. So you are going to be using either a piece of equipment like this, um, or depending on how much current you need to generate, uh, or like this, or possibly something this large. Uh, but on very large projects, I would think they, they might have equipment like this, but normally you're not going to be dealing with that type of equipment. And you know, Tom, this is kind of a good segue to the next slide because we're just going to briefly show the uh, secondary injection or simulated fault current uh, injection method which is just like what Tom said, this is it's kind of more of a, another method. So simply you have another, uh, a separate winding, like the image shown to the left, uh, to, to, to the right of the screen, and you inject uh, some signal uh, through this winding and it would trip your system. The problem with this method, which I'm guessing is the uh, reason, I know Tom, you said on panel 10, so probably this is the reason that you guys decided to not allow secondary injection anymore that if you use secondary injection to test, you can detect any neutral to ground connection downstream of the current transformer. This method cannot detect it. You can detect incorrect polarity. If your polarity is not correct in your current transformers, uh, you can make sure that there, all the conductors are passing through the CT. There's no emission of any conductors, which is the problem that we described. And in the uh, when you have an integrated trip unit, like the low voltage uh, breakers, uh, you can use this method. You, can just, you don't have access to the current transformer to use the secondary uh, injection method. So because of this flaw, I believe it was back in 2017, the code making panel 10 decided to require that commission or performance testing is done specifically using primary injection and current injection is not allowed anymore. So if you are still on 2014 NEC or any edition prior to that, you can still do a, a secondary injection based on the HJ approval, but 2017 and on, you must have uh, you must test your system using primary injection only. And this was the trick in the question that Tom and I had at the beginning of the presentation, the Menti question. Yeah, now, um, uh, Christopher Fink pointed out, and it's a valid point, that the uh, primary current injection testing doesn't mean you need to take all of your overcurrent protected devices out. There are methods, depending upon the gear, depending upon the situation and application, that they can do this testing while the uh, devices are still in the equipment. So... Uh, there are methods to do uh, testing, and, and there are reasons to do that uh, as an assembled unit uh, as well. So, um, because those CTs might be around bus bars and things of that nature. So, it's uh, uh, but but one of the, the the interesting things that you're pointing out here, Nihad, is uh, <clears throat> the uh, the wrapping of that CT. I've I've used that method to. Uh, I would say simulate or trick out one of our relays in a in a uh, demonstration perspective. We'll take that CT 
uh, you know, get the right turns ratio, wrap it around a few times, program the relay to tell it the, the ratio of the CT, and then it will look like you have a lot more current than what you actually have. And that's good for educational environments and training uh, applications. We make little demo boxes where we teach people how to set relays. And if you do that wrapping, then you can simulate higher currents than what are actually there. You know, it's Ampere's circuit law. Ampere, it's the number of turns multiplied by the current is what triggers the uh, the uh, current transformer. So if you have 100 turns multiplied by X amount of current, then your current is multiplied by, by a factor of 100 now instead of the actual current. You know, this is the method used for uh, GFCIs. When you press test and reset, this is like there is a separate winding in, in the device or the FCI, GFCIs for sure, that would just do this trick for you. And I used this when I was working on designing GFCIs. Uh, I want to say hi to my friend, Chris Fink. He, uh, last time I saw him was in Reno at ESW. Hope you were safe and uh, healthy, Chris. Awesome. And thank you for uh, attending. Yeah. The one last thing before we move from this slide, I know to the left, I haven't talked to the image on the left-hand side. Some of the current transformers, or the old current transformers, they have two different windings. And that's why you kind of notice. So they have a test winding. So like Tom said, you can get a, 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 a winding and wrap it around the current transformer to create this, you know, to fool the, the system and, and simulate a fault. But some current transformers would come with a test winding. So you can hook up into this test wind that's already, I guess, hooked up or wrapped up for you in the device itself. Absolutely. You need an extra winding, I guess what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and th this is a very interesting point, and this is something I guess we uh, touched on when we were describing the uh, uh, talking earlier, earlier than ground fault protection. So, uh, 1053, the first time I learned about 1053, there was this odd requirement that it requires that any GFPE or ground fault relay system uh, listed to UL 1053, it must be operable for a voltage down to 55% of its rated voltage which is kind of weird. Why would you go down to 55%? Like I was thinking in terms of like, a, this is like a brownout condition. Like, you know, like why would the voltage go down to 55% of its rated voltage? Right. But the explanation is on this slide, which is something I didn't know until later, because I always thought there was like an odd requirement for 1053. So this image here, we have a ground fault relay, and this relay is fed from the line from the system. So the, the power going through the relay is through phase A and phase B. There's like a, a little CPT, which is a you know, control, uh, control uh, potential transformer that feeds the control, the circuitry of your relay. And we're just using 80, 840 to 120 because it's a very popular turns ratio, but there are other turns ratios that you can use. So for this system, we have 480 volt to 120, that the 120 is feeding your GFPE or the relay system. And again, the, 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 the system is fed from phase A and phase B. Let's, uh, let's kind of think what happens when we have a ground fault on one of the two phases feeding the, uh, the, the relaying system. So in this figure, we have a ground fault on phase A. When we have a ground fault on a phase, what happens to the voltage? It collapses to zero, right? Because it's right. connected to ground. So all of a sudden, your ground voltage, your, your line voltage, line A voltage is, is connected to, is to ground and then your phase B stays at line voltage, right? So now instead of feeding 480 volt, which is the line to line voltage to your system, now we're feeding what? Line to ground, right? Mm -hmm. From circuit classes, remember that the difference between there's a factor of root three. So instead of feeding 480 volt to your system, now you're feeding 480 divided by root three, which is 277 volts. So now the primary of your CPT is seeing 277, right? Yep. So what happens on the secondary side? Instead of seeing the one, the full 120, the 120 drops by the same ratio. So instead of feeding your relay system 120 volts, now you're feeding it with 69 volts, 120 divided by root three. If you do the math, 69 is around 85% of the rated voltage because of this drop. So to guarantee that the system is not going to be blindsided or it's not going to fail, and it's still going to be operable even if the ground fault is on one of the lines feeding your, your relay or the GFPE system, UL943 requires that you must be operable all the way down to 55%. 1053. UL1053. 1053. Yep. 1053. So 1053, yeah, right. I said 943. Yep. 1053 requires that you must operate all the way down to 55%. Uh, percent. Yep. So in this case, 
if your system is rated at 120 volts to feed the GFPE control circuitry, it can it must be work operable all the way down to what's like 55 percent. It's like less than 60, right. 69 percent, uh, 69 volts to make sure that if you have a ground fault on phase A or phase B, the phases that are powering your your relay system, the system would still detect a ground fault. You don't want yeah. it to be sitting there <clears throat> not doing anything. And in some cases, you might have a an actual UPS of some of some sort inside the equipment supplying power to that relay, so you don't exposed you're not exposed to those lower voltages. Right, absolutely right. Yep. All right, we're in the home stretch. We're going to talk about applications yep. for GFPE. These are all the different areas where we see a lot of use of GFPE outside of the service equipment. You know. A lot of people just fall back on the National Electrical Code and say, well, I need GFPE at 1,000 amps and above. But in reality, uh, ground fault protection of equipment closer to the load is actually better for you because now you isolate the load as opposed to taking out the main. So you want some level of selectivity in regard to clearing that fault down closer even on the branch circuits. So we'll see in some cases, depending upon the application, uh, an extended use of ground fault protection of equipment down closer to isolate power uh, problems in the power distribution system closer to the loads. And you know, Tom, when it comes to applications, uh, I, I, I really like the word ubiquitous, the word ubiquitous, which you don't get to use very often, but when it comes to ground fault protection... Wait, wait hold on. Very... Hold on. Ubiquitous? Okay. Yeah, you, uh, ground fault protection is ubiquitous. Like how often you can use this word. I get so excited when I can use it. Well, I got to look it up. Ubiquitous. It's like something that is everywhere. That's right. Present, yeah. appearing, or found everywhere. All right. This is ground floor protection for you. So uh, I, I always kind of joke that, you know, this is one of the very few incidents, if not the only one that I can use uh, ubiquitous as an English word. So uh, on this slide, I'm not trying to, like Tom and I didn't try to show every, uh, all the applications. It's just an example because again, ground fault yeah. protection is ubiquitous. It can be used everywhere. Like this slide is not showing food and beverage, for example, industry, utility, use ground fault protection. Uh, you know, filming industry, like in the entertainment industry, they use it because of the, their ground, uh, their portable uh, generator that they use when they're filming outdoors. So they use ground fault protection. It's pretty much like every, every uh, uh, industry segment that there's always GFPE can be used. And you know, it doesn't have to be a code requirement. Sometimes you have an expensive piece of equipment, expensive a pump or motor that need, that you wanna be protecting, right? So even if the code doesn't require a GFPE, sometimes the, the user would just choose to protect this expensive equipment from ground fault protection because you don't want to uh, burn your windings or lose the right. motor because of ground fault protection. You know, within all those industries, we can, have ground fault protection, protecting motors, like I said, pumps, generator, portable generator, or or uh, permanently uh, or permanent generators, whichever generator you have, you could have ground fault protection. Feeders, if you have important feeders, you can have uh, feeder uh, ground fault protection for your feeders. So again, it's ubiquitous, right, Tom? I like what I like what you're throwing out there, Nihad. I'm buying every 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 nickel of it. Yeah, like Mohammed said, this is like the big words here. Yeah, this we're using like big words. Today. Uh, yeah, in the other applications or marinas, and and we and I reason I threw that in there is because Article Five Fifty Five um, uh, puts some specific requirements in around marinas, and and these are just some images of the the problems that you'll come across where you know ground fault protection of equipment can help identify a problem before it, somebody comes in contact with it. So uh, the thought process in in uh, the recipe for success for uh, GFPE and marinas was to uh, to you, have, we have 100 milliamps at the at the uh, feeders going out to the uh, marina, and then we have 30 milliamps for going out to the boats, and then you have four to six milliamps on anything that you're plugging into from a receptacle perspective, the 15 and 20 amp uh, devices. So the what I liked about the marina application was they 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 staggered that protection, uh, provides the ability to selectively coordinate those ground fault protections, so you only take out the boat and not the entire main. So, um, Don Ganier is saying we have installed. Thanks for joining us, Don. Uh, Don Ganier and, and Muhammad and, and Steve Froming. Uh, I didn't see Steve Froming in the house, y'all. So, 90% of contractors say that you just press the button or hook up a laptop. It would be good if you, to have instructions 
shipped, it clearly states what the test method is. And you know what, Steve, it's a good point. I know we're trying to do a lot better in regard to uh, getting instructions in with the uh, products and solutions. John Gunnar says, we've installed some ground fault protection in the starter circuit for motors over 50 horsepower because the client had feeder breakers trip on a motor ground fault. Yeah, I'm telling you. So, the, and, and it didn't, and the starter didn't over and open the overcurrent protected device. So my philosophy, and, and my philosophy has always been to put GFPE as close to the load as possible and then not up in the power distribution system. And the and the reason I and the reason I go there, either either you put it down close to the load or you put it everywhere because what you don't here's what happens. And I've heard this many times. Uh, you'll take an electrician who a little bit lazy and doesn't want to uh, go find the overcurrent device and he's in 277 volt lighting, so he just causes a little fault figure and he'll open up the breaker and boom, he takes the main out in the entire facility. Or or he's up in that lighting fixture doing justified energized work and accidentally uh, um, uh, causes a fault and then boom, it takes out the main. If he would have had the feeder or the branch circuit that had ground fault protection of equipment, it would isolate that problem faster. And it's easier to troubleshoot for the electrical, for the electrician, for the, for the electrical worker to find the problems because now you've isolated a smaller portion of your distribution system. Uh, Don saying he was sitting on CMP5 task group for the first hour of uh, my part of the presentation probably should have been at this. There you go, Don. I'm telling you, buddy, you know where it's at. It's right here at five o'clock every Thursday. I mean, come on, except for next Thursday, because what it is Thanksgiving. And Nihad, we enjoy Thanksgiving yeah. down here in the States. I, yeah, you guys don't yeah, play I, with Thanksgiving, do you? Uh, it's in October. In Canada, it's in October. October. There you go. We already uh, had it, yeah. There you go. Um, all right, so let's move on. We're almost at the end. We have the code requirements, and and you mentioned the Canadian Electrical Code. There's a they mirror each other for the most part, right? They're very similar. You mean the only difference I would say Canadian Electrical Code, the, the acronym GFPE is not there. Like they just spell it out, ground fault protection of equipment. Yep. So you won't find if you look up the if you have the PDF and look up the uh, you know GFPE acronym, you're not going to find it. But the requirements are very similar. You know, just like GFCI requirements, they're just very similar. And if you go to the next slide, I can have a list of all the requirements in both codes. Like for the NEC, so the main section, like Tom kind of coded the section uh, 230.95 multiple times. This is where you have all the uh, requirements, performance testing, uh, tripping requirements, and everything in 230.95. But then there are other articles, like I kind of listed some of them that calls, they call out 230.95 for brand circuits, Feeder protection, overcome protection, healthcare, you know, uh, critical power uh, operating uh, power system, operating uh, critical operation power system. So they all refer you back to 230.95 because this is the main article, uh, uh, main, main requirement section for the uh, GFPE. Yeah. Canadian Electric Code does the same thing, very similar. <laughs> Yeah, and and you know you have these, but but I I I just threw I didn't put the article or the section numbers in, but we we already mentioned marinas and floating buildings. We got in Article Four Thirty. There's ground fault on motor circuits, but we get that done with the overcurrent protective device. We have heat trace and deicing and melting heat tape and things like that. So I didn't write all of the sections down, uh, uh, but but there are numerous places within the National Electrical Code where you have the requirements for ground fault protection of equipment. Now. Most of those outside of 230, which has a maximum 1200 amps, and now marinas, we put the 100 milliamps in and 30 milliamps. Uh, anywhere else, it, there's no specific statement on what current that you need to trip at. So, um, but you would probably want to make sure that your, uh, your ground fault currents are uh, within that threshold, whatever. Uh, it, you know, for the most part, on the devices like I, I showed earlier, that 30 milliamp is, I mean, it doesn't take much to get you over 30 milliamps. So yeah, just but, saying. And you know, so Tom is showing the kind of a similar slide on the Canadian side. And you know, I know there's some Canadian on this slide, so let me translate for our, our American <laughs> friends. <laughs> because in the Canadian Electric Code, a section is a chapter. So when you talk about chapter two, chapter four in the National Electric Code, it's a section. 
in the Canadian Electric Code. So section 14 is equivalent to a chapter in the NEC world. And then rule is the Canadian word for article. So rule 14-102 is like equivalent to an article in NEC. And then the C, the Canadian Electric Code doesn't go in detail. Like it doesn't talk about first, first, first division, first subdivision, uh, first, uh, first subdivision, the first level subdivision, second level subdivision. Mm -hmm. So everything is a rule. So rule 14, rule 14-1002, whatever. It's just rule and section. So Canadian language is a little bit simpler than the American language, you know. <laughs> and you guys use millimeters and centimeters up there too, and that's supposed to be I easier. Know. Celsius. You can do Fahrenheit. Awesome. And that brings us finally to the end, Nihad. We went over a little bit of our two hours. You know, Tom, I was thinking since it's, uh, you know, just trying to kind of justify, we, can, we totally blew out the 15 minute kind of tech talk, right? This oh, is kind of yeah. way out long. It's no, no time. But hey, I know it's Thanksgiving and happy Thanksgiving to all my American friends. I know it's a big deal in the US. And you have. The uh, Black Friday coming up soon, right? Oh, yeah. So I was trying to kind of position our presentation. So you sign up for one 15-minute TikTok. And guess what? You get like eight or maybe nine of them. <laughs> so at the same price as one, right? It's Black Friday. You ain't right. It's you're being... Be you know, TikTok. Chris TikTok. says you're, be you're being ubiquitous. I guess, yeah. So it's 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 my jam, ubiquitous. <laughs> I love it. I just I, I know many years ago I learned this word like ubiquitous. From, like I me, mean, English is not my first language. Obviously, everyone knows this. So I learned ubiquitous, but I didn't. I never know how to use it. And it's just like a weird word. Like you know, even a lot of my English speaker friends, native English speakers, don't use it, right? So uh, I just didn't know how to use it until I said, "Oh, ground floor protection. It's everywhere. It's ubiquitous." So I started using it. That's right. That's right. Excellent. So, so um, next Thursday, I'm not going to be online because I'll probably be full of turkey and stuffing and all of that uh, cranberry sauce and all that other good stuff. Um, I might throw up a video. I'm going to try to work on some things, and uh, we've, we've got uh, I've got some scheduled stuff coming in December. We're going to do um, uh, we're going to do our section two forty eighty seven in depth. And I believe we're going to offer some CEU credits on that one. I'm doing that with uh, David Smith and the Illinois Central Division chapter uh, asked if we would want to do, they, they want to try to help us out with the CEU credits. So we're going to, they're going to sponsor that from a CEU perspective. So that should be a good thing. Uh, we're not going to charge for that. So that's going to be a two hour program on 24087. And we're coming up with some other ideas as well. So every Thursday, except next Thursday, I'm going to be on 5 o'clock to 7 or 5 to 5.15 or 5 to 6, whatever it works. So this was 5 to 7.19 so far. You get, a, you get a deal. You sign up for one 15-minute TikTok, and then you end up getting 6 or 8, or if you're lucky, you may get 10, right? Yeah, and then pretty soon... Pretty soon, you're, you're, you'll start hearing our voices in their heads, and we won't even be on online. Yeah, it's, it's just like, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Muhammad, yeah, that's that's a picture from uh, the Power Systems Experience Center and uh, Dan uh, Carnavali and crew. So, uh, I'm... Uh, you know, I totally forgot. I wanted to ask you to maybe put, uh, like, a, some background for me, maybe in Hawaii or something, because it's snowing out. It's almost like zero Fahrenheit outside. Sucks. I, I know, to man. I Told you. That. You can move to Weirton West by God, Virginia, and, and not have to worry about all that snow. I mean, we get a little bit of snow, but not big. No, we, we got like, what, uh, two weekends ago, we had a big storm, which was very abnormal. We got uh, almost two feet of snow, like five, 40 centimeters. Wow. 30 and 40, uh, uh, yeah, close to two feet. Yeah, it was crazy. Awesome. Well, I, you know, I want to say thank you to Felix Sandoval, Christopher Fink, Don Ganier, Muhammad, Felix, or uh, Joe, Joe Bellantoni. He's in there too. Man, I didn't see him. And and Mathur Abbasi, everybody out there, happy Thanksgiving. Don't eat too much this Thanksgiving. Stay away from the COVID. Don't put as much of that on your sandwiches. Um, and uh, be safe and be healthy. Uh, enjoy yourself, but don't get too wild and crazy, right? 
we have all the big names out there. So um, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And you guys stay safe. And please, please stay safe. And you know, don't take chances in this weird times that we're living in. And I look forward to see all of you in person soon, hopefully after this COVID-19 just flows away and just be a thing in the past, from the past. Amen, brother. All right, everybody. We're going to give you back the rest of your evening. I'm going to give you back your evening, Nihad. Thank you very much for dialing Thank you, in. Thank you. It was very, uh, I enjoyed it. It was great. I hope I hope people found some uh, good information there. I hope so, too. Thank you, Don Ganier, Felix Sandoval, and everybody else. We're going to shut down for this evening. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe. And remember, please stay healthy until next time, which not be, won't be next Thursday, but the Thursday after. We will see you soon. Please subscribe to the uh, to my channel if you can. Hit the thumbs up. Don't forget to hit the bell. You'll get notified whenever I put new materials up. So, And I'll probably be loading some videos up. I just put one up. Uh, to hopefully, we'll save some people some money on 24087. You guys should check that out on my uh on my channel as well. So take care. It was pretty, good. It, Tom. It was pretty good video. I would say it's, yeah, it was great. I appreciate I that. To the, next, to the next program. I will be uh, back to the audience. So I'll be looking forward to it. All right, brother. Take care. Yeah, stay safe. Good. God bless everybody. And uh, well. I'm going to, I'm going to shut the channel down. You can stay on the I'll be, uh, I'm going to hit this end button. So,